Hi, everyone, and welcome to our MBA on Ruby and Ruby on Rails. My name is Casey, and this is Eduardo. Hi, everyone. So I'm an instructor of Ruby on Rails at Coding Dojo. Um, I study mathematical science from UCSB, and I am Korean Brazilian. That's why my name is Eduardo. Also, I'm a huge Lakers fan and not a Clippers fan. <gasps> Well, Steve Ballmer will be very disappointed to hear that. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Casey Champion. I am a content developer here on the Microsoft Learning Team. Before this, I was a software engineer on Outlook Web App. Um, but my passion really lies in education, which brought me here, and also is the reason why I teach high school every morning before work. I teach Introduction to Computer Science and AP Computer Science. And in my spare time, I train service dog puppies. Awesome. Yeah, it's for a good cause. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for showing up and stick around. We've got a lot of really exciting things you can do with Ruby and Ruby on Rails. Hi there. Welcome to the MVA about Ruby. In this course, we're going to talk about the Ruby language and we're going to show you how to use some really popular frameworks to put it to best use. Yeah, so why would someone want to learn Ruby? First, Ruby is a completely object-oriented language. So everything is an object in Ruby. Basic data types, like strings and numbers, and even booleans. Wow, that's a lot of objects. <laughs> yes. So if you're familiar with OOP, then Ruby will be very familiar to you. But if you're not, then Ruby syntax is very forgiving and easy for beginners. The documentation is great and, and easy flowing. Yeah, absolutely. Ruby syntax is really written to read like a sentence. It looks like human language makes it pretty easy to learn. Yeah, so Ruby's philosophy is to is aimed to make programmers happy. Uh, the creator of Ruby, Yukito Matsumoto, really focused on that when he was designing the language. So you can see that when you're writing Ruby where it's really easy to write code. Wow, specifically designed to make developers happy? Yes. That sounds like a pretty good idea. So, <laughs> By a programmer for programmers. Ah, oh, I want to be a part of that. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, why learn Ruby? A good web framework, a popular web framework, Rails, is built with Ruby, and that's what we're going to focus on this course as well. So, why use Rails? First, it's an open source web application used by many companies such as Airbnb, Groupon, Hulu, Kickstarter, SoundCloud, uh, Funny or Die, GitHub, and Shopify. Wow, that's a lot of very different web apps, and some of which are not very simple. Yes, so it's very, it's, it's very robust. It's been around for a while, so it's easy, it's easy for people to pick it up because there's great documentation, there's great, great tutorials, but it also it scales well where production companies put code out there in production. Wow, okay, so easy to use and super powerful? Yes. Wow. Pretty impressive. <laughs> so Rails is famous for enforcing the model view controller design pattern. So if you're familiar with MVC, then Rails will be very familiar to you and easy to pick it up. Also it has Active Record, a ORM or object relational mapper, where you don't really have to write SQL queries to be able to query the database. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, SQL without actually having to write SQL? Yes, so it will provide methods for you to query information without actually having to write the SQL code yourself. Uh, that sounds pretty nifty. Yes. <laughs> so also Rails is a great it's great for beginners because it gives structure for users. So if you're just learning web development, it will give it will, it will give you good practices so that you don't get into bad habits. It, it, it encourages the restful resources and also has testing. Wow. So not only is it going to give you a lot of tools to get started, but it helps you use those tools in a really effective way so you don't learn any bad habits. Exactly. Another, another thing about Rails is that it's great for prototyping. So there's this concept of scaffold where we could create a whole application in only four command line lines. Wait, wait, wait. So you can make an entire application from scratch in four lines? Yes, and I'll show you that in the demo later on in this module. Wow, OK. Uh, I can't wait to see that. So when, you, when would you want to use Rails? Rails is a full stack framework where it's going to allow you to interact with the view, and the database, and everything that comes in between. So it's going to do a lot of the configurations for you. And unlike some frameworks that, that only work on the client side, Rails will be the whole thing. Oh, OK. So 
um, it gives you that ability to structure your web app, not only just the UI, which is what a lot of things do, but also all the way to the back end. Yes, so when you create a Rails application, you're going to be able to create your own web. You'll, create, you'll have access to your own web server locally where you're going to be able to develop in there. Oh. Also, uh, with the growth of front-end frameworks like uh, Angular and Ember, uh, Rails is great to feed JSON APIs to be a API endpoints so that people could, could make API requests to, to a Rails application. Okay, so you really can combine Rails with some of your favorite client-side frameworks for full-fledged web app. Exactly. Uh, lastly, Rails is great for testing, and it'll provide you tools to be able to test your code all the way from the beginning to the end of your application. Oh, so yeah, it's going to give you a lot of tools to have some great best practices. Exactly. So let's look at the big picture of the internet. So where would Ruby and Rails fit in into this picture? So we have our client on the left-hand side, and we have our server. So Ruby is going to be a server-side language, and Rails will be the framework that is going to use Ruby to serve data to the client. So the client is going to make an HTTP request for a specific file. How are we going to get the file to the client? So Ruby will do some logic along with the web server and the database to package that data and give it back to you as an HTTP response. OK, so it helps you in this communication back and forth between your app and the server. Exactly. Okay. So now, let's look at some installation. So if you're in Windows, RailsInstaller.org is a great website where you could install Ruby and Rails in one fail soup. So if you go to the website, if you, uh, you want to use Ruby 2.2 and Rails 4.2. Right now, the current versions of Ruby are 2.3 and Rails 5 just came out. Hmm. But for now, we'll, we'll be using 2.2 and 4.2. OK, so when I download this, what do I get in my download? You're going to get a package, and you're going to have to run the executionable file that's going to install Ruby, configure Ruby, and make it work with Rails smoothly. OK, so I get Ruby, I get Rails, and do I get a web server along with it? So Rails is the framework that you're going to use, and the framework will come with a web server where you could just develop in your local machine. Awesome. If you're using Linux or Macs, you, you could use RVM, which is a version manage, manager of Ruby. And Rails is really just a gem, or just a package that you can install, and that will allow you to give, it will give you access to the framework. Oh, OK. So by installing Ruby, you could just jam install Rails, or download Rails, and you'll be able to use it in your computer. Awesome. Great. So now that you know exactly why you want to use Ruby and its framework Rails, take some time and make sure that you set it up in your own machine, because in the rest of this course, we're going to get to work writing our own code. And we need you to be able to follow along. Hello, everyone. Before I mention how we could create a whole web application with only four command lines, let me show you how to do that. So first, we need to create a Rails application. Rails, new, and I'll call these Pokédex. So our application will be named Pokédex. Here, we're just creating the files that we need. And if you see here now, we have the Pokédex folder. Let me just open the directory so you can see that. So it's just a folder with a bunch of files. right? So I'm going to go into that folder, see the Pokédex. And once I'm here, I have a lot of Rails commands that I could use. One of them is the scaffold command. So the scaffold command is going to create all the views, the controller, the models, and even our database schema so that our application can run. So here, I'll do Rails generate scaffold Pokémon. And the Pokemon will have a name, string, and the element will also going to be a string. So the name and the element, they're just the columns in our database. So that's what that, that signifies. The string is the type of that column. Press Enter. And it creates a lot of files for us. So this is our whole application right here. After doing that, we have to rake the migration. So it actually creates our database. And lastly, I'll turn on the real server. So Rails server. Here, here it is. It's running on port 3000 locally. So I'll go to my web browser and local 
post 3000. We see that Rails is working fine. If we go to slash Pokemons, we have this website where we could create a new Pokemon. So let's do that. My favorite Pokemon is Pikachu. His element is electricity. Create Pokemon and Pokemon successfully created. I could add a Pokemon. Let's say he's electric. Update Pokemon and now he's an electric type. I could go back and here I could have a whole list of all the Pokemons in our Pokedex application. So let's create a new one. Let's say Charmander, his fire, create Pokemon. And if I go back, Charmander is now in that list. With only four command lines, I was able to create this whole application. Sure, by using the scaffold generator here, Rails is doing a lot of work for us. But in this course, you learn how to make a Rails app from top to bottom. One of the best things about Ruby is its commitment to being object-oriented. Yeah, so everything in Ruby is object-oriented. But what is it? So OO uh, is about classes and objects. So classes is the blueprint of your objects. So they're going to help you structure how your objects are going to be. So classes will have characteristics and, and also methods or actions. For example, a person class could have a characteristic for, for example, a hair color, eye color, height, weight, but then you could also have actions. A person could walk, could run, could yell, and things like that. So it's a combination of the data or attributes and the behavior or actions that you can then do with this data. Exactly. So let's look at some, uh, at some code here. So Ruby, everything's an object. So we could invoke the dot class method to see what class that object belongs to. So here I have a bunch of code here. I have one dot class is from the fixed num class. One point five dot class is from the float, and we could even see that boolean values have a class themselves. Wow! So really, every single thing in Ruby, if you call dot class, you're going to figure out what class it responds to. Exactly. So that's very powerful because you'll be able to see that everything comes from something at least. It's not magically there. So next, I'll demo a little bit of IRB, which is interactive Ruby, and how you can play with Ruby yourself just by, just by opening your shell. Great. So now it's your opportunity to finally dig in and play around with Ruby. All right. At this point, Hopefully you've really understood what an object is, but how do you make one? Yeah, so let's go ahead and make a person class. So here in the code, we have a class person and an end. So to start a class, you write the keyword class, the namespace, which will be person in this case, and then an end, and you have a class right there. So now we can instantiate it. So person1 equals to a person.new or a new person. Person2 equals to person.new, another new person. So here I want to show you that these two persons are totally different. So we could look at their object IDs, which would be just a number assigned to them when they're created. Is that something Ruby assigns? Yes, that's something Ruby assigns to the object when they're created. So here you can see that person one dot object ID is different than person two dot object ID. So really, there's two separate spaces in memory that have been assigned for each of these individual and separate persons. Yeah, exactly. Even though they come from the same class. Gotcha. So that's the power of classes and objects. We could have many objects of the same class. I see. So here we could check if they're even equal to each other. We, Ruby provides a method, a method that we could do that. So person one dot equal question mark person two, and that will give us false. I see. So the method that is called equal question mark, that's checking is person one the same as person two? And even though they might have the same attributes, they don't have the same settings, the same data, they're different people. Exactly. So they, in memory, they're two different objects. So their locations are different, so they're not going to be equal to each other. Now, let's talk about the attributes or the data. So a person could have attributes such as name or age, but how can we write that in code? We, uh, Ruby provides the add symbol. So add symbol are instance variables that are going to be related to attributes. So in this class person, I'm going to assign the name attribute to be John Doe, and the age attribute, which will be 37. So now we could call print the person 
dot instance variables and it will give us those two things in an array. Okay, so it will list out what attributes this person has. Exactly. So here we're hard coding the attributes, but now we could change them. What if we don't want everyone to be called John Doe? What if someone wants to be called uh, Jane Doe? So we could, what we could have is we could have setters or setting attributes, methods that will set attributes for us. So here you can see the class person, I have a method called name equals to str and name equals to str end and then the age attribute age equals to num at age equals to num and then end. So I see that one of those has parentheses around the data type and one of them doesn't but it has an at sign. What's the difference between using the parentheses and using the at sign? So the one that we use for the parentheses, they're arguments of the method. So those are going to come in when the method is called and that's how we're going to set different names for different persons. The at sign, you're setting the attribute of that person to be whatever is coming through the method. So on the right hand side, you can see that I first instantiate a person, p equals to person.new, and now saying p.name equals to John Doe. So even though there are spaces in assigning the name attribute, we're calling the def name equals method that we, that we have written in our class. Okay, so by putting the str in the parentheses, you're saying the name method is waiting for a string parameter to be passed in. And then you use the at sign to refer to exactly which attribute you're going to set, and you just set it equal to whatever you were given. Exactly, and the same works for the age. Now, after we assigned it, I, you could print what's inside the p object, and we could see we could see some some information about it. And the name attribute is whatever we assigned John Doe, and the age attribute is thirty seven. Now we could create other objects and say, okay, this person will be called Jane Doe, and this person's age is twenty five, or whatever you want. Wow. Okay, so that makes our objects really flexible. Exactly. So here's how you set it, but how can we retrieve them? How we can get it? So we could also have write methods to get attributes. So here, the hashtag dot dot continue means that this class person is built is is built upon of the previous code that we have. That's because the hashtag is a comment, right? Exactly. So that line of code actually doesn't run. It's just a comment for us humans to understand. Exactly. So now we have a method called def name, and all it does is return a name. And then we have the def age, and all it, do, all it does is return the age attributes. Okay, great. So you can put information in, and now you can get information out. Exactly. So after we set them, we could just call the methods to be able to get them as well. So getting and setting is very popular, as you may imagine. So how can we write this a little better? How can we make our code a little cleaner? Right? So here we have the complete class that we just wrote. We have the two setters for the, for the name and the age. And we have the two getters for the name and the age as well. So we could use the shortcut called attr underscore reader, and that's a shortcut to write the getter methods just in one line of code. Okay, so before it was going to take us essentially three lines of code to say, hey, anybody that calls me by name can get whatever information is stored in this attribute. But they assumed that you were going to want to do that, so they added attribute reader so you can just combine as many getters into a single line of code as you want. Exactly. So that comes with uh, the importance of naming conventions now. So you want to make sure that you, you're naming your attributes in a correct manner so that you could use the ATTI reader that Ruby provides. So now, how can we do the same for the writer? So here we have the same person class that we just wrote, and we can see that on the right hand side we have ATTR underscore writer, name and age. Now, the class in the right is the very same as the class in the left. That's because we're using that same shortcut like the reader, but now we can do the same thing for the setters and turn those into one line. Exactly. So, how can we do both? So, now we could use something called the ATTR accessor. Now we're going to have getters and setters for both the name attribute and the age attribute. So, that whole person class on the left hand side could be just turned into one line of three lines of code in the right hand side. Ooh, I like that a lot. But what about if I don't want somebody to be able to set my class, I just want them to be able to read the attributes of my class? Then you wouldn't want to use the accessor every single time. So make sure that when you're writing a class, you have in mind what kind of uh, 
what kind of visibility your attributes will have. Oh, okay. So I can manually set the visibility with less slightly unclean code, or I could use the attribute accessor and really clean it up, but then I make everything public. Exactly. So what do we want to set attributes while we're instantiating a new object? We could use a special function called initialize. So here we have on the left hand side def initialize, and I have two arguments, object name and object age. And I'm setting the attributes at name to whatever the object name argument is, and at age to whatever object age argument is. So now on the right hand side, I could do something like this p equals to person.new, pass the John Doe string, and that will be set to the name attribute. And then I'll, you're passing also the 37 to be the age attribute. So now, since I have the both accessors, the name and the age, I could just call p.name to be able to get John Doe and p.age to be able to get the age. Okay, so it's essentially like we've added a constructor. We've given our class a way to accept in information on the initial creation of it, because they're probably assuming that if you're going to make an empty class, you're going to fill it up with data real quickly. Exactly, that's exactly what it is. The initialize function is a method that gets called whenever you initialize or create a new instance of this class. Great. All right, so now you've got all the different pieces and a way to initialize it. Take some time and create your very first Ruby class. All right, now that you know how to make a class, let's dig into the details. Yeah, so when we're writing a class, what if we want some type of reference to the current object that we're working with? That's when the keyword self comes in. So if you look at the code, we have this class person on the left hand side, and we have an instance method called return underscore self, and all it's gonna do is gonna return self. So self is a is a keyword where it's always gonna keep track of what object I'm currently working with. So here we have p equals to person dot new, and we set the name attribute to be John Doe and the age attribute to be 37. Now I could call return self because it's an instance method and it's going to actually return the current object. Uh, so look how we could do puts p dot return self, which is going to be just self dot name, and that will be John Doe, and we could do the same thing for the age. So the self is really our way to access what is in this particular object. Yes, because when you're writing a class, you often want to do things to the object itself. So how we do that? With the self keyword. I see. So do you have to always make sure that you're defining a getter for the self in your object? No, this was just, this was just for the example. So you could write a method that will return self, mm -hmm. but you could do things, you could write a method to do things to self and you don't really have to return it. You could just change self inside of a method. I see. Okay. All right. So next we're going to look at class methods. Uh, so let's say we're writing a game and we want to keep track of how many persons are using our game. This is not something about, this is not really pertaining to the object itself, it's pertaining to the whole class. So how can we do that? So class attributes starts with the two add signs. So you can see on the left hand side, I say add, add count equals to zero. So we just, stay, we just say that count will be zero at that point. And inside of initialize, we're going to increment count by one every single time a new person is instantiated. Now we write a method called self.howMany. So the key part there is the self. That self is not pertaining to the objects anymore, it's pertaining to the whole class. So that method is a class method, and all it does is going to return the count. So if I'm writing a class method, do I always have to do self. Yes. Everything that you, if you, do not, if you do not include the self dot, that means you want the method to be an instance method. So you're going to be able to be, so objects will be able to reach into it and call them. The self makes sure that it's a class method. Okay, so really what you're doing is you're starting to combine the static parts of a class with the dynamic parts. So you can both create new objects out of one class, but also store information about the whole collection of objects. Exactly, but it's always good to know what kind of, what methods should be classes, what kind of attributes should be classes, and what kind of methods and attributes should be objects. So on, on the code, you can see that we instantiated two, two persons, uh, one John Doe, who's 37, and a Jane Doe, who's 24, 
but now I call person capital P the how many. That means of the person class, I'm calling the how many method that returns two. Okay, and I see that you specify a class attribute with two at signs. Does that mean I as John Doe person, can I change that in any way? No, you cannot. So that's why separation of concerns in that sense is very powerful and very important. I see. So we're keeping high fidelity information by making sure only the overall person class knows about it. Exactly. So next, we're going to talk about inheritance. So on the left hand side, we have a class called parent class. And we have the ATCI accessors for the name attribute. We have an initialized method that's going to set the name and print something every time something's initialized. And we have an instance method called parent method. On the right hand side, we have a subclass. And the little caret there in, uh, it signifies inheritance. So you're saying the subclass inherits from the parent class. So we have an initializing method for the subclass as well. And we have super. Super, super is common in OO languages. It all it means I want to call the initialized method of my parent class as well in, inside of my current initialized method. Right, so super is giving you as the child class the opportunity to leverage whatever work your parent is doing. So instead of writing your own constructor, you can just call the supers. Exactly, so that's what you do. So you just write super and automatically call the initialized method of your parent class. Next, we have a sub method that is for the subclass. So if you look at the code snippets in the bottom, I, uh, we have an example equals to a subclass new MVA but notice that it prints initialized method in the parent class. So because of super, the constructor of the parent class is being called, which prints that string. Next, we say example.parent method, and since everything is being inherited, we, the, the current object of the subclass has access to the parent method in the parent class. Right, so you don't have to explicitly recreate work you've already done in the parent, if you're inheriting in the child. So even though there's no definition for parent method in the child class, you automatically get access to it by calling your parents. Exactly. And that's all done by the little caret that we see on the top of the namespace. Next, we have puts example.name, which is just an attribute of the subclass, and, and that's what we get. And then example.submethod, which calls the instance method of the subclass. So it's kind of like you're getting all of the goodness of your parent class, but you can add as much on top as you want. Yes. So that's the power, power of inheritance. Great. So hopefully at this point now, you've got a little bit more complex tools, and you can build a much more useful set of objects. Hello everyone, by now you have installed Ruby, but how can we run Ruby code? First, I'll show you how to create a Ruby file and then run that file so we can see the output on the screen. First, create the file, I'll call demo.rb and I'll just open the file into Sublime. You may use any text editor you may like, it, Sublime is just my preference. So here I'll paste some of the code that we saw before. But I just wrote the print command in front of everything. So here I'm saying print the string into string, whatever this output is. And let's run it. All you have to do is run Ruby and the demo, name of the file. And there it is. Those are the answers that we expected from the slide. But what if I don't want to create a file, I just want to run some simple Ruby code? Well, we could use something called IRB or interactive Ruby. Just Type IRB in your terminal, and here IRB opens up, and we could write any Ruby code that we may like. Put hello MVA, and that will give us back hello MVA. Or we could say, give to me, print it, what one dot class is, and it gives, it gives us fixed now. So here I showed you how to create a Ruby file and run it, but also how to use the IRB or the interactive Ruby so you could write some simple Ruby code and get immediate feedback. All right, in this module, we're gonna start talking about Ruby syntax. And in this very first part, 
we're going to start talking about the if-else structure. So let's look at some control flow in Ruby. Here in the slice, we have comparison operators, the equality operators, and the Boolean operators. So very similar to any other language that people ha have been using. So it's the same in Ruby. Great. Now let's look at the if-else trees. So here on the left-hand side, we have x equals to 10. If, if the value of x equals to 10, we're going to print x is 10. Otherwise, we're going to print something else. As you, as you notice, we don't have a var in, like in JavaScript, or we don't have braces in many other languages. We yeah. just have do and ends. So there's like no curly braces? There's no semicolons? Like no, we do not have <laughs> any of those. So we, you, could put, you could put those. It, the, the language does support it, but we don't have to. So, so each block of code here on, this, on the slide it could be indented, but it doesn't have to be, and that's how you, uh, how you show a block in Ruby. So the really important part to end a line is you just hit enter. Yes. Awesome. Okay, and I also see there's an if statement at the top, and then there's the word end at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So the end will signify the ending of the tree, right? So let's say we only had one if statement. We'll put the if, the condition, the block of code, and then an end, right? But, but because we're using an if else in this case, we want to have an if, the else, and then the end. Yeah. Similarly, on the right-hand side, we have an if, else if, and else tree. So here we have x equals to 11. It's the value of x 10. If it is, then print x. Then we're going to check another condition. It's the value of x 5. If it is, then print 5. And we don't need that extra e in the else if? No, we don't. So uh, that's just how it is in Ruby. Gotcha. And a little shorter. Programmers <laughs> are lazy, so we like to keep things short. So otherwise, we're going to print x is something else. OK, good. I like to tape as little as possible. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you guys a little bit about the alternative syntax. Uh, oftentimes, we'll do something like programs will do something like if not something. Well, instead of doing that, we could use the unless statement. It's the same exact logic. So if you look at the slide, we have x equals to 5. Unless x, the value of x is 5, print x is not 5. Otherwise, print x is 5. So in this code, we, what we'll end up with is a string with x is 5. Awesome. So on the right-hand side, we have x equals to 10, y equals to 15. We have something interesting here. We have print x is 10 if the value of x equals to 10. So in Ruby, what we, we, what we could do is say, OK, let's do this if a condition. So instead of having all that tree, we could just put everything in one line, which looks pretty clean. Yeah, and it reads like a sentence, especially with that word unless. Yes, so the point of it is to read it like a sentence. So we want to use things. Ruby allows us to write things in one line. Oftentimes, you'll be able to do even, even iterations in one line. So here we have print y is, not, y is not 10 unless y equals to 10. And there you can see that we're going to, say, we're going to, we're going to get x is 10 and y is not 10. Brilliant. I really like how nice and clean that is. Yes. So now is a great opportunity to take a chance and play around with the new syntax of the control structure. Three, two. All right, now let's take a closer look at some of the syntax for loops in Ruby. So loops. We have three kind of loops here. We have the for, the while, and until loop. And let's look at some syntax. Here on the left hand side, we have a for loop in Ruby. We say for i in 0 dot dot 5. We're going to print i, and we see the end here again. So what we're saying here is for i in that range between 0 and 5. But the two dots means we're including the top range of the, of the top number of the range. So it's going to print 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. On the right hand side, however, we have for i in 0 dot 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 5, and we're going to print i. So here we do not include the 5, but we go up to 5. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. OK, so there's a one very small difference between these two pieces of code. Yes, exactly. There's only one period. <laughs> OK, so if I use two periods, then it's? Inclusive. And if I use three periods, it's? Exclusive. OK, gotcha. But the start number is always inclusive. Yes. Okay, and I also noticed there's no do for the for loop. 
Yes, so for loops are very common that we omit to do, but it's, you could think of it being inferred in here. Uh, gotcha. So here in the while loop, we have i equals to 1, limit equals to 9, and while the i is less than the limit, we're going to print the iteration number, and we're going to increment i plus 1. Here we do have the do and the end, actually. So on the right hand side, you can see the output. We have iteration 1, iteration 2, all the way iteration to 9. Okay, and I see some kind of interesting syntax. I see my first curly brace. What's yes. going on? So here we're saying put iteration colon uh, hashtag open braces, hashtag uh, i, and then close braces. So the hashtag open and close braces mean that we're, we're going to string interpolate the value of i at that point. So we're going to print, uh, Ruby's going to get the value of i, turn it into a string, and print it with the string altogether. Okay, so what would happen if I had forgotten to put my hashtag and my curly braces? Then the, then the Ruby wouldn't uh, interpolate the variable, it would just be a string of i. Gotcha. Okay, what other things can I put in between those curly braces? So you could do any simple logic in Ruby. I wouldn't recommend putting any heavy logic in there. So if you want to just put things into a string, and you want to say iteration, let's print i times 5, mm -hmm. right? And then it will it will multiply i by 5, and then print the number that it gives. OK, gotcha. So pretty important to remember that hashtag curly brace. Yes. <laughs> uh, another thing that I wanted to, to know, we use the plus equals, plus equals syntax. So in Ruby, there is no such thing as plus plus or minus minus. We always want to increment something. We use the uh, i plus equals 1, or whatever number you want to increment by or decrement by. So next, we'll do the until loop. So i equals to 7, and this loop will run until that condition meets, until i is less than 0, right? So we're going to print iteration uh, i, and then we're going to say decrement i by 1. And until we hit that mark, we're going to keep executing the loop. So here, we're going to say on the right, we see the output iteration 7, 6, 5, 4, and then finally negative at the end. Okay. So if I'm going until i is less than 0, and I'm starting at 7, what would happen if I change that less than to a greater than, and I make it until i is greater than 0? Well, by then, i is already 7, so we already reach that point, so the loop will never run. Oh, OK. So until is just like in our control structure, it's giving us that automatic sort of bang operator, the not. Exactly. OK, great. Well. Now that we've got a bunch of great loop syntax, it's a really good opportunity to go ahead and write some of your first loops in Ruby. Okay. Three, two. Okay, now you've got some Ruby syntax. You probably want to organize it and put it into some methods. Awesome. So here we're going to talk about functions in Ruby, or aka methods. And let's look at some syntax. So on the first one, we have def method name. So def is a keyword that you're going to use to write a method. In JavaScript, you might, you, it's the function keyword. Mm. In Ruby, it's the def and an end. So we have def method name, and we have parameters, argument 1, argument 2, and argument 3. OK, and I don't see a return type. You don't have to tell it what you're going to return. It will just return whatever value you want it to return. Gotcha. And then I see an end at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so everything has an end. So you're going to start the, the method, and then you're going to have an end to signify that you finish writing the method. OK. So here on the, second, on the second example, we have method name. Argument 1 equals to value 1. Argument 2 equals to value 2. Argument 3 equals to value 3. That's how Ruby supports default values. Mm. So if someone calls this second method and doesn't pass argument 2 or argument 3 in, the values that we have here set, that's what Ruby will, will interpret as. OK, but I could still define my method this way and pass in values that would get overridden? Yes, you can. Oh, OK, wow, that's really flexible. <laughs> so let's look at some examples. Here, the first one we have def multiply. It simply is going to return the arguments multiply by each other. So on the right-hand side, you can see that we multiply 10 and 20, and we get 200. Uh, the second one is with the default values that we see. 
we say argument 1 equals to 5, argument 2 equals to 2, and we multiply those. When we call it, we're not passing anything. If we did, though, like we mentioned before, those, those will be the values of those arguments. I see. Right? So oh, just in case you, you forget to put something in, you could put a default value. Great. On the third one, we say argu argument 1 equals to 1, argument 2 equals to 2, and we multiply argument 1 and argument 2, and we're passing 5 and 6 into the method. Now, I noticed that this third one is kind of missing something. Yeah, so you see that it doesn't have the return in there. So when we write methods, Ruby would, would return the last line of our methods automatically. So we don't have to say the keyword return all the time. So it'll assume I'm going to return this if I haven't seen a return anywhere in here. Yes. That it's the last line. The very last line. Very last line. Oh, OK. So then when would you want to use a return keyword? So usually, let's say we have an if condition and if else condition. Let's say if something, I want to return that argument inside of the if block, then you want to use the return so that Ruby knows that it needs to get out of the method. Oh, OK. So like other languages, return means stop execution. Yes. Gotcha. OK. Great. So now you've got some nice structure for your methods. Why don't you take some of your loops and some of your conditionals and put them in a method and give it a shot? Hi again. Now that we've talked about lots of different types of syntax, let's talk about how Ruby has actually added a bunch of logic for us in the form of iterators and how you can talk to those iterators using blocks. Yes, so before we were using for loops to do things multiple times, Ruby will give us methods that we could use that would do the same thing for us, but in a much easier way and much cleaner. Ooh, I like easier. Yes, <laughs> and cleaner as well. And we're all lazy, right? Yeah. So let's look at, the, at this piece of code. We have five dot times open curly brace puts the string hello MVA as uh, close curly braces. And as you can see, it will print hello MVA five times. Great. So what is five? Good question. In this case, five is the object and times the method that we're calling that object on. So this times method is the instance method of the five object class. I see. And so just like we would with any object in any method, it's accepting in some input. But it looks like in this case, the input is logic? Yes. So, so blocks are little snippets of code that we could give methods that are written that set blocks. So for example, here we're saying puts hello MVA. It doesn't have to be that string. What if we want to print hello world? right? So we could change that because that method times accepts that block of code. I see. So I see that I've got a single line of code that I want to pass in. What if I want to do multiple lines? Good question. So let's look at the next example. We have five down to one, do pipe i, and in there we're going to print i and take off if i, and print take off if i equals to one, and then we have the end. Okay, so I see a lot of things that are new to me here. What do the parentheses do? So just like any other method, methods also accept arguments. So just because we're the, the method accepts a block doesn't mean that we, don't, we can't pass arguments into it anymore. Right? So here, with the parentheses, we're telling it, OK, 1 will be the lowest range of our down to function. So from 5 down to 1. I see. OK, so then we've got this pipe i pipe. What's going on there? Yeah, that looks kind of weird. So pipe i pipe there is something called the block variable. Every time we're iterating from 5 down to 1, the method is yielding a block variable to us, and that will be whatever i is at that point, or whatever iteration number we are. OK, so i is just like in our for loops, our iterator variable. Um, and so we're just declaring it within the context of this block? Yes, exactly. So here, we're going to print 5, and then the loop starts again, 4, and then 3, and then 2. And then i is finally 1, so we also print takeoff. I see. So after the end line, what happens to i? Uh, so block variables are only within the block, so we don't have access to i anymore. OK. Next, we have the each method that we could call on array. So we, right here, we have a, an array with the numbers 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Do an end, and we have the pipe or the block variable lm, and we're going to print element with the value of lm every time. OK, and I see something kind of familiar. We've got the hashtag and then the curly braces. Yes, so here we're string interpolating again. 
So we get so what Ruby is going to do is going to take the value of lm every single time and print that with the array so the, the string element. Oh, okay. So what does the variable lm represent? So the each method will know that you have to start from the beginning of the array all the way to the end. Or for for so from the index of zero to all the way to array length minus one. So lm will be the value at that index every single time. I see. So it's sort of like the each method takes care of the indexing for us. Yes, and that's very useful. We don't have to write a whole for loop. If we want to iterate through the array, we could just use the each method that is an inst instance method of the array class. Awesome. Sounds super useful. Yes. <laughs> so next, we'll talk about the select. So it's not just the each. We could use the select method that returns a new array depending on what type of condition we put in the block. I see. So this one is really looking for essentially like a Boolean logic for which pieces to keep. Exactly. So here we have first array equals to negative 20, negative 10, 20, negative 30, 40, negative 50. I have a variable called positives where I'm going to select only the elements that are greater or equal to zero. I see. So, and we get back a brand new array? Yes. So the method is written in that way that will return a new array that, that returns all the methods, all the numbers that are selected according to the the check that you did in the block. Wow, that's a lot of logic for Ruby to do for you. Yeah, so let's kind of walk through the select method. So negative 20, negative 10, excuse me, we'll go into the lm block variable and check is, L, is negative 10 greater or equal to zero? If it's not, then throw it away in that sense. And then 20 will go in, is 20 greater or equal to zero? Yes, so we select it. And then negative 30, no, 40 we select, and then negative 50, and that's what we get back. Okay, so after the select method has done its job, has it changed first array in any way? No, it returns a new array. Great. So it sounds like Ruby has done a really great job in taking care of a lot of logic for you. Yes, yeah, so we saw each and select, but those are not the only ones that we could use to iterate through things. So we could use the reverse method that will reverse the contents of the array. We could also use the reject that will do the opposite of what the select is. So there are many other methods, and I highly encourage you to go to the Ruby docs, look at the class array, and, or, or any other class that you're working with, and look at the methods available for you. Great, because I can use all the help I can get. <laughs> <laughs> so like Eduardo said, take the opportunity, look through all the different methods, and try some of them out for yourself. In our last video, we learned about all the different ways that you can use blocks by passing them into methods. But how can you write methods so that they're actually listening for these blocks? Yes, so in Ruby, when we write methods to, that will set blocks, we could yield to them. So here in the code, you can see on the left-hand side, we have a method called yield practice. And all it's going to do is going to print in the method the block is next. Then it's going to yield to whatever block of code is being passed to on the method call. And then it's going to print in the method again. So on the right hand side, we have yield underscore practice. We call it and we pass the block, uh, print whatever piece of code I want. So the output is in the method, the block is next, whatever piece of code I want, and in the method again. OK, so what is happening at the yield keyword? So the yield is going to look at the block that you passed in in the method call. And it's going to, it, you could think of kind of copy and pasting the block of code into the method. and it executes the method for you. So it's like, okay, that thing you've got, use it here. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. Okay. All right, so let's look at uh, how to pass information. So we, we talked about black block variables, but how do they work? So you think of yield as also uh, being able to pass arguments into it. So we, I modified the yield practice method that we, had, that we just had, but this time I'm passing hello MVA. So now, when we call the method, we have to say, OK, I'm accepting a block variable now. So we have the double pipes, and it's going to print the block variable with string interpolation. So what we get is in the method, the block is next, block variable hello MVA in the method again. I see. So the yield is still the place where we're cutting and pasting our code. But by giving it the variable, then we're inserting that into the code we wrote in the block. Yes, yeah, so now the block could take that information and do whatever it wants with it. 
So that could be very useful when we're doing something like iterating, right? So let's look at the next uh, slide that I have here. So here we have a class fixed num, and I'm writing the my times function similar to the times function, and I have a loop. For i in 0 all the way to self, I'm yielding to the block. So what is self? So self in this case is the instance that the method is being called on. So if you look at the right hand side, we're saying 2.my times. In that, in that particular case, self will be 2. On, on, uh, underneath it, we say 1.my times. In that case, self will be 1. It's just the instance that we're calling the method on. So it's kind of like the global variable within that object that's referred to as self. Yes. Gotcha. So now we have hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Oh, OK. So all we need to do if we want to use blocks in our methods is we need to make sure that we're yielding so that we can take whatever code is given to us and put it in the right spot. That's exactly right. Wonderful. So now you know the secret behind how to get methods to listen for blocks. Take some time and give it a try. At this point, you've probably got some really useful methods. So useful, in fact, it'd be really nice if you could use these methods across multiple classes. That's where modules come in. Yes, so modules are ways to package methods together so that we could include them in multiple classes. So if you write a really good method that you feel is useful in multiple classes, you don't want to duplicate code to put in those methods, just put in a module and include that whole module into those classes. Oh, I hate duplicate code. Yeah, <laughs> that's the worst. <laughs> so, so here in the code, we have a module called my enumerable with two methods in it. All that, all that we have to do to include it in whatever class we want, we could use the include keyword with the name of the module. OK, so I'm looking at this, and I see my keyword module, and I give my module a name. Mm -hmm. And then I see two methods, but can I put as many methods as I want in here? Yeah, you could put as many methods as you want, and just be careful to make them work to the classes that you're including those modules. I see. Right? So here in the code, for example, the my select, it will only work for arrays, right? Because the select is only returning a new array. So I challenge you to kind of think about how you could implement it to other classes. For example, how would you implement the my select in a range? Um, one thing that you could do, you could use the self, uh, self variable to check the class that you, it belongs to. Maybe self.class, and then and then with that, you write your code accordingly. OK, so the self variable is really going to make sure that each of my methods adapt themselves to whichever class they're being included in. Exactly. And that's how you have multiple methods that could work across multiple classes. I see. And so no matter what, no matter how many methods I have in each of my modules, if I use that include keyword, it's going to go in take every single one of those methods and add it to my class. Exactly. It's like you're almost copying and pasting those, those methods in those classes without really duplicating the code. So it makes your code a lot more reliable. And if you need to make a change, you only have to make, make a change in one place instead of making change in however many classes you included that method in. I love that. <laughs> so let's look at some code. On the right, like, like I mentioned before, we're including the enumerable uh, module. And we call the my each function. We have an array with one, two, three, four, and we have a block variable that prints the element. So here, uh, when we call my each, we have for i in zero dot self dot length. Self in that case will be the whole array. So we get the length of it, which is four, and we yield the block or execute the block that many times. So that will print one, two, three, four. Now let's look at the my select. We have an even uh, variable that's going to be the array one two three four dot my select, and the block variable that returns a boolean is the element even question mark. Okay, yeah. What does the question mark mean? Good question. So by convention, the question mark uh, behind the method name is is going to return a boolean value. Can I can I do that last part again? Yeah. Do I just want to go for my question? Yeah. Okay. So by convention, method names that have a question mark at the end we return a Boolean value. So for example, is the number even? Question mark. It, it can only be true or false. So those, those are conventions in Ruby. You see it all the time across all the methods in, in the docs. Oh, OK. So it doesn't actually have any specific function. It's just a convention as part of a name to indicate to you, hey, 
this method is going to return a Boolean. Yeah, it's just a naming convention. Okay, great. So my select has a variable called result equals to an empty array, and we're returning that when we were returning the result at the end. But let's look at the actual grant work that it's doing. So here we have self dot my each uh, open block block variable x result less than less than percent less than less than x if yield of x. So the less than less than means push. And what it's doing is saying, okay, whatever block variable is in is coming from my each, I'm gonna push x if the block returns true. Okay, so the yield statement is waiting for a Boolean, true or false? Yes. Let's say it gets a true, what happens? It's gonna push into the result whatever x is. And remember, x is coming from the my each block, which is gonna yield each number of the array. Okay, so it's what it's doing is it's looking at each thing in the array, checking that the yield is getting a true, and if so, it dumps it into the result. Exactly. Okay, and if we look at the sample code, it looks like we're deciding there what the yield is going to result in, true or false. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the block where we call the my select, we're doing is the element even, question mark, and if it is, then we want it to be selected into whatever that's going to return. I see. So the elm.even, that's what our yield x is doing. So what we've got is we're looking for each even value. If it's even, we're going to dump it into our result array and eventually return that. That's exactly right. Awesome. Now that we have a really nice way to organize all of our methods together, I encourage you to look at some of the methods you've written and turn them into one extra useful module. Hello everyone. Let's talk about classes. Here, I'll write the fixedNum class, a pre-existing class in Ruby, and I'm gonna write my own method. Def, who am I? And all this method's gonna do is gonna print self, or the current object. Print, I am self. Here we have a little bit of string interpolation. And what I could do I could call the method or any instance of the fixedNum class. So I could say 10 dot who am I, 5 dot who am I, and if I run that, as you can see, it prints that string. I am 10 and I am 5. So self simply is the current object that invoked the method that we wrote. Awesome. But let's write our own class and not write a method in a class that already exists in Ruby. So let's create a person class. Class person, and for now it'll be just empty, but we can instantiate that class. p1 equals to person.new, and p2 equals to person.new. Each time we write person.new, we're instantiating the person class and saving it into a variable. So here, p1 equals to a new instance of the person class, and p2 equals to a new instance of the person class. Every time we do that, Ruby will assign an object ID to each instance. So we could check that. Let's print p1.objectID and p2.objectID, and they should be different. And there, there it is. They're totally different objects, right? So now let's write some setter methods to, for a name attribute and the age attribute. Def name equals to a string, and I'm going to say the name attribute, I'll set it to whatever argument gets passed into the method. Same thing for the age. And we want to say age instead. So this, this might be a little confusing, but the equal sign is just part of the name of the method. Now, what we could do is say, all right, for the first person, let me assign its name to be Eduardo and his age to be 28. 
All right. Now, if we run this code, we, don't, we do not get any errors because we have assigned the name attribute and the age attribute correctly. But what if we didn't have those methods? Let me comment that out and let's run the code. And as you can see, we get the undefined method name equals. So that's what we have here. Name equals is just the name of the method that we use to assign the name attribute. Now let's write the getters for, for those attributes. Def name, and all it does is going to return the name attribute. And def age is going to return the age attribute. Now, after assigning those attributes, I could get it. And let me print it. And let's run the code again. And as you can see, we printed Eduardo and 28. Now, what if we didn't have those methods? When I try to call them here, we're going to get another error. Undefined method name, right? And if I comment this one, we will get undefined method age. So all we did is manually write our getters and setters for those attributes. However, getting and setting attributes in Ruby is so common that it provides little shortcuts for us. So instead of having to write the, get, uh, the setters every time, I could just use this little shortcut, ATTR writer, and I could pass a symbol name and an age. So this symbols will so these symbols will match the attribute that we're trying to access. Now what we have here for the name attribute write a write a setter for it and for the age attribute let's write a setter for it. So now I don't have to manually write this code. So let's see if everything works fine still, and it, it looks like we're able to set things okay. We could do the same for the getter, attr reader. So let's read those attributes. Let's read the name attribute and the age attribute. Now we could take out the readers and just have two, two clean pieces of code here. So if I clear here and run the file again, and it looks like everything is fine. If you need to write and read attributes, we could just use the accessor method that will create the reader and the writers or the setter and the getters for us. And we don't have to have two lines, we could just write in one line. And if I run the file here again, everything works fine. So this is how you write getters and setters in a person class or in any class. Now, what if you want a method that would initialize or construct every time you instantiate an object. In Ruby, that method is called initialize, and you could pass arguments to it, let's say name, object name, and object age. And for each, each time this method runs, it's going to set the object's name to be whatever is getting passed in into the method, and its age to be whatever is, is getting passing through the method. Let's close that. So now if we just try to run this code here, we're going to get an error because it is expecting a couple arguments. We given zero arguments, they expected two arguments, right? So let's, let's pass those in. So first I'll have Eduardo and age 28. And the second person will be Kobe. I think it's 37. And if we run this file, now we don't get any errors. So we could get P2's name and P1's name and print that onto the screen. Awesome. So you can see each person now has their own name and has their own age and they're being set when we call the initialize function every time we instantiate that object. So this is the basis of classes in Ruby. I hope you enjoyed.
At this point, hopefully you've got lots of great tools in your Ruby and Ruby on Rails toolbox. What we're gonna talk about now is how to actually put those together and build something in an effective way. And we're gonna do it with test-driven development. Yes, yeah, so with TDD, is we always want to make sure that we're testing while we're making progress in our application. So with TDD, we can write our test first, write minimal code to make the test pass, and then after that, we refactor. So we'll make sure that we're always on the right path while we're writing Ruby code. To be able to do TDD, we use a famous gem called RSpec. What is a gem? So we talk about the Ruby community, and gems are a big part of that. People have written a lot of Ruby code before, and they package it in gems. So you could download it and use it. So RSpec is just another gem that may help us write tests. It's a testing library for Ruby. So really, a gem is just a really cute way to say library. Exactly. So when we use gems, we want to be really careful to what we download, because if someone it stops support for it, your code might break and things like that. But usually, it's very powerful, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Okay, so RSpec is a gem that somebody else wrote to make it easier for you to do test-driven development in Ruby. Exactly, and I'll show you how to correctly do RSpec and test-driven development in our demo. Great, so stick around for that. Hello everyone, let's talk about TDD, or Test Driven Development. In this session, we'll be using the RSpec gem. If you have not installed it yet, we will have an installation guide in the notes of this module. So as you can see here, I have a folder called people underscore spec underscore demo, and I have two files, a person.rb file and a person underscore spec rb file. The person.rb file will be our Ruby code or our actual class that we're gonna have tests for. The person underscore spec file will be the test that we will be writing for our person.rb file. So in TDD, we need to write the test first, write some code to pass it, and then refactor. How can we write the test? First, we will need to require relative the person file. So all this line is doing is requiring the contents of this person.rb file. Next, I'll be testing the person class. So we start with rspec.describe. What are we describing? The person class do, and it takes a block. So same, this is just simple Ruby code, guys. This is just a block of code, a block, a Ruby block. Now we can separate each test into it blocks or their own sections. So here I'll have it has a getter and a setter for the name attribute, do, and. And in this block, we're gonna write some simple test to make sure that what we described here in this string is what we want. So now we're gonna say person p equals to person.new and p.name equals to Kobe Bryant, p.age, not the age, and we expect p.name to equal to what we set it above. So a lot of things going on here. The it block is just the, a simple block where we're going to describe and test if the feature that we want is working correctly. Here we're just instantiating the person class and we're setting the name attribute to Kobe Bryant and we expect it's a method, we expect the name attribute to equal to whatever we set it above, which is Kobe Bryant. So now we run the test, so let's go back to our terminal, and we're gonna run rspec person spec.rb, and we press enter, we're gonna see a failure. And we can see that the, what we describe in the it block, that's the message that we get, right? So it's very important that you write clear messages when you're writing your tests. So it's failing because we haven't written any code, and that's good. Now we're gonna write the appropriate code to make the test pass. So we know how to write getters and setters. Def name equals name, we'll set the name attribute to be the name that's passed in. Def name equals to add name. 
So now when we run the test, we can see that there is only one test. That's what the dot symbolizes. And it gives a nice little green message, one example and zero failures. Now that we have written the code to pass, let's refactor. So we have written the test, we have failed, we have written the code to pass. Now the last step of TDD is refactor. We know how we could refactor this code. We could use the attribute accessor. So here, instead of writing those methods, I could say ATTR accessor for the name attribute, right? Now, if I run the test again, one example and zero failures. Now we could write the same test, it's very similar test for the age attribute. Here it has a get and a setter for the age attribute and p dot age equals to 37. And we expect this instance's age to be 37. Now, if I run the code or the test, we can see that now we have two examples and one failure. And the test is person has a get and a setter for the age attribute. So let's write the code for it. Def age for num is going to set the age attribute to the number that we get passed in. Def age, which is simply return the age. Now, when we run the test, we can see that we have passed. Next step, refactoring. We know how to do that. We could just say name, accesses for the name and age. And there we go. The last test that we're going to write is to test if we have an initialized method. So let's write an it block. It has a initialized method that sets the name and age attribute to and p equals to person dot new Kobe Bryant age thirty seven p dot and we expect p dot name to equal to already be equal to Kobe Bryant and we expect the same for the age. Thirty-seven. Let's run the test now. Now let's write the initialize method. Def initialize name and age. All it does is set the name attribute to be the name and the age attribute to be the age, and end. Now I'm going to run the test, and as we can see, we get two failures now. The initialize seems to be working, but now we get two different errors. A person has a get and a setter for the name attribute, and a person has a get and setter for the age attribute. All right, so what can we do here? If we don't give any arguments, let's give them a default argument, and we know how to do that. Here in the initialize, I'll say, if nothing's passed, let's set it to default, default name. And for the age, I'll set it to zero. So now if we run the test, three examples and zero failures. So we could see that even if we write something that for one test, it could affect the behavior of other things that we're trying to do, right? So this is a quick demo on TDD. Welcome back. At this point, you should have a pretty good familiarity with the language Ruby and its syntax. But now we're going to talk about the Rails framework and how you can put Ruby to work making web applications. Exactly. So Rails is a model view controller architecture, and it's going to help us organize our Ruby code to build web apps specifically. Try, imagine, try imagining building a social media platform only using Ruby and no framework. And so think, all procedural? Exactly. That sounds like a lot of code. <laughs> so think about, think about how your code will look like and how would you even start? By combining Rails with our object-oriented programming knowledge, we're going to separate everything that we need so that our code becomes more modular 
easier to maintain, and a lot cleaner. So Ruby on Rails will help us accomplish that. But what is a model, what is a view, and what is a controller? Here I have an analogy, a Microsoft Store. You could think of the model as the storage room, where all the goods are stored. It will often, oftentimes be the database. The view is what the, what the client in a web application sees when they go to your website through a browser. The controller is the Microsoft employee. It will take order from the view, find the product in the storage room, combine those, and finally give it back to the, to the client. So it will be sort of like the mediator between the model and the view. Now, how do, now I have this picture so you can see we have a view on the left hand side with a bunch of people. The controller is the Microsoft employee taking orders from the view and talking to the model to get a product. But how does this apply to Ruby and, and Ruby on Rails? Here on the left hand side, we have the browser or what, what the client will see. And there are a list of four players. This web, this web page has a unique URL that is going to come through a request. So Rails will look at the URL through, and the router file will, will figure out where to go, which controller to go, and which specific action to execute. So I, as a user, I type in a unique URL, and that tells my Ruby on Rails framework to go talk to a specific controller? Exactly. So that's, that URL is going to be often unique, and the router file will figure out where it needs to go and it will be a specific controller and a specific method in that controller. Now, the controller will, will, will figure out if it needs to get information from the database or it needs to just render a template. Oftentimes, we'll have to talk to the database. So the controller's job is to get all the information that it needs so that the response is successful. So we'll talk to the model. The model will give the information to the, from the database to the controller, and, we'll give, and then the controller will feed that information to the template and finally package it all together and give it as a response back to the client. OK, so the controller is talking to the browser, but it's also talking to the model where our information is stored and getting things from the database and deciding which templates to display. Exactly. Yeah. Well, controller sounds like a pretty good name for it then. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it controls everything that your web application needs. Great. So next, we're going to talk about more specific parts about this MVC framework. Great. Can't wait to get started. Hello everyone. After installing Rails, you have the command line interface available to you. The command line interface is how you're going to interact with your Rails application through the terminal, for example. So let's create a new project, and this project will be my our own way to, to track players in a basketball league, for example. So here, I'll create a Rails new. So that's the command to create a new project. and here you say whatever the name your project your project is. So for us, I'm going to call it Rails New League. Okay, this command will create your project folder as you see here with your Rails application. So let's wait until it finishes and it looks like it's done now. So I'll change the directory into the League folder and I'll open this in Sublime or your favorite text editor. So here, I'll open this in Sublime, and here we have it. So this is our Rails project. So if I run Rails server, which is how you start your development server, we can see that once we open our browser now, we'll go to localhost 3000, we, our Rails application is up and running. So let's take a look at the project folder. Let's go back to Sublime. This app directory is the most important directory that you're going to have. So we're going to have the controllers, which will be the employee or Microsoft employee, for example. We're going to have the models, which will interact with the database, and our views, which is what the client sees. Here, another important folder that we have is our DB folder. Here, we're going to have something called migrations and uh, mig migrating files or schema and things like that and we're also going to have another important file is our gem file so by default 
a Rails application will come with all these gems and oftentimes you'll be using other gems to make your life easier. Let's say we're trying to use an API from Google or we're trying to use an uh, OAuth authentication. There are gems out, out there that will make your life easier to build in Rails. So as you can see right now, I'm using Rails 4.27. Our database right now is SQLite 3. Uh, it already comes with jQuery, so it's really nice. So it's a full full stack framework. It will provide you with a lot of things. So I want to show you how to start a new application and what uh, how the directory looks. All right. So in the next video, we'll be covering creating models and how how migrations affect your work and things like that. So see you then. Great. Now you should have a pretty good understanding of the MVC or model view controller style of framework that Rails provides us. And in this unit, we're going to talk about the M or model part and how to create your very own using the command line interface. Yeah, so Casey mentioned the command line interface. That's a tool that Rails will give you to interact with your app through the command line or through the terminal. So how to create a model? If you look here at the slide, we use the CLI and we use the commands Rails generate model. So if you type this out into your command line, you're going to get this documentation. And it will tell you exactly how to create a model. So let's create a model for a player. Here, that, that's the command Rails G. You can use G for short for generate model player. And that player will have a name type string. And that player will also have an age type integer. So like we've talked about before, the model will often talk to the database and insert things to the database, retrieve, or even delete data. So it's very important that we set up the, the model how we want it to reflect into your table in the database. Other attribute types are primary key, decimal, flow, boolean, references. Those are for relationships, and we'll talk about more about references later on. A binary text, date, time, date, time, and integer. OK, so when we use the command line interface to generate a new model, it's going to determine the types of parameters that can take in and already do the hookup to the database for us? Yeah, but to be able to make a hookup to the database, we have to use something called migrations. Oh. So that's perfect, because now when we create a model, it will create a couple files for you. More importantly, it will create a model file, and it will create a migration file. So a migration file is, you could think migration as a version control, and it'll keep track of how your database schema has been changed throughout the time of your application. So when you create a model to say, hey, I need a player model with this type of columns, then you get a migration file, and that it will be just Ruby code, that once you run the migration, it will actually create a table with those columns that you need. So now that we talked about models and migrations, I would like to do a demo on them. Great. I can't wait to see it. Welcome back, everyone. In this demo, I will show you how to create a model, uh, and I will show you how to create migrations, and go a little more in depth on what migrations are and their use. So here I have our league application that we created in the last demo, I will first see what the Rails generate model command will give us. So here we type Rails generate model, and this is how you generate a model. But if we don't write anything else, we'll have some nice documentation about how to create a model. So here, just wait on to load. And we have all this information that if you want to read more about, you could go ahead and read about it. And also, you could go to the docs. But depending on your database, Rails will give you some information on how to create the model. So let's do a player model. So I'm going to create Rails generate. We could have G for a shortcut, model player name string age integer. Here, we're going to create a model player, and it's going to have couple attributes. It's going to have a name attribute, which is going to be a string, and an age attribute, which will be an integer. So let's run this. So this command generates a couple files for us. Here it creates a migration file. Here it creates a model file. 
and a couple of test files that we won't go into so right now but definitely later in the course so let's see how they look like i'm going to open this in sublime again you could use any text editor that you like it automatically creates this model file so the command created a player class which inherits from active record base this line is very important this is how active record or the orm that we're using is going to relate this player model this simple class in the models folder to a players table in our database i mentioned before that we're creating a couple attributes here name string age integer these will be the columns in our database okay so for now we still don't have anything in our database, but we do have a migration file. If you go to the DB folder, inside of the migrate, migrate file, we have this file with a timestamp and a, a name create players. So this is simple. This is just some Ruby code that Active Record will use to create the table when we run the migration. Migrations are ways for your app or for the Rails application to keep track and kind of version and kind of act like as a version control for your application so every step that you do and every change that you make to your database you'll be making through migrations and you're going to run those migrations and those are going to be recorded so everyone will know what happened to the database and how the database used to look like and how it looks like looks like now for now we don't have a we haven't created those tables once we run the migration the table will be created. All right, so let's go ahead and run the migration now. Rake db migrate. This is how this is the command to run a migration, and you see that this Ruby code just ran. Right, we created this table players. We created this players table, and we'll have a couple attributes. Along with the CLI, Rails will give you a console, sort of like IRB but it will load your Rails application with it. So in your terminal, if you could follow me, type Rails console. Again, there's a shortcut for almost everything in Rails. We could write Rails C instead, and that will do the same thing. The Rails console, it loads the development environment, aka your whole app in development, so that you could play with the schema, you could add things to the database without having to use a GUI or anything. It will, everything is in your terminal, which oftentimes developers appreciate because then you never have to really use your mouse or go anywhere, right? So one important thing is that we talked about this class player model, right? So what Active Rec is gonna do is the ORM that we're gonna use. For those that are not familiar with ORM, is, it stands for Object Relational Mapper. And what it will do, it will map this player class to the player's table, like I mentioned before. And it will turn those things into instances of this model. To further prove my point, let's try to create some players, or let's see how the player's table look like. So again, using the ORM, we're going to instantiate a new player, right? So, so same syntax from Ruby, right? We're going to say, hey, this variable p is going to be a new instance of the player. Okay? And you can see now that if I say p, right, I have this new instance. It's not still, it's not saving the database yet, right? But it is, it is an instance of this player class, right? Now, let's save this player to the database. First, I'm going to say p.name equals to let's do eduardo and p dot age equals to 16 8 all right so now this p this p instance of the player class has the name attribute to be eduardo and the age attribute to be 68 now we could run the save command which will actually save this instance into the database P dot save. Now we can see what this does. The save command will run this query, the inserting query into a database. One awesome thing about the ORM is that it will you it will give you a lot of commands, 
but it also gives you some feedback and also will tell you what, exactly what it's doing to run that command. So we can see that it, be it begins the transaction and it runs the SQL query. So we mentioned before that that Rails is awesome for beginners because people don't have to use, don't have to write the SQL queries themselves. And this is what I meant by that. We have everything is objectified so that even beginners could could easily interact with the database without writing SQL, right? Now we have we have saved the player, right? How do we retrieve? We could write, and but how do we read now? So to get all the players or to get everything from the database using the ORM that is given to us, we could run a command like player dot all. This command will give me all the players in my database right now. Okay, so you can see that this player dot all method. This is dot all is simply a class method on the player class, and this is why the OOP section in the Ruby part of the course is so important. Now, if we if we simply understand that dot all is a method that you could call on any class that will simply run a query that that will select the corresponding table of that class then things get a little more easier and a little better to understand because the ORM could be sometimes could be complicated. But now this is not very readable. So let's insert an, another player and I'll show you another way to create a player. We could say player.create. So create will run the new and the save method at the same time. So before we run the new and then the save, now to do both at the same time, we can say create, and I'll say the name attribute will be called Christopher Burns. Christopher, let's do just Christopher. His age will be 80, right? And I'm gonna run this, very similar to what we saw before. It begins the transaction, inserts it to the database, and commits it. Now let's run player.all again and see what that gives us. It gives us an array of objects, right? But this is kind of hard to read. And there's an awesome gem out there to prettify the output that we see. So let's do that. So let me exit the console. And I'll go back to my gem file. And the gem file, we're going to add this gem called Herb. So this is how you add gems, any gems that you use into your into your project. You go to the gem file and add the gem. And then you run bundle install. As you can see, we could find herb somewhere right here. We have installed herb successfully. We're using herb. Let's go back to the Rails console now. We're going to have herb.enable. That, that is true. And I'll run the same query, player.all, and we have a table, nice and pretty table, right? So Herb is a gem that I use that will help us read the, ta the database. When we have something like this, sometimes it gets really hard to read it, right? So there we go. I'm going to enable Herb again, all right, player.all. Alright, so we learned how to create a new instance of the player model, right? We, we learned how to insert that instance into the database, into the player's table. How can we update something? How can we retrieve it and then update, right? So let's do that. There are a couple ways that you could read something or find a specific thing in the table, a specific ID, for example. I could do player the first that will give me the first player in the database, not the first ID, just the first player or the first row in my database. Okay. I could do player the second. I could do player the last. Right. But what if we want to search by a specific column in our database? We could do player dot find and the dot find method will look for the ID by default, right? So if I do, let's say, an ID that doesn't exist, it was 
throw me an error. Couldn't find a player with ID 10. So let's find a player that actually exists. Player that find two. Right? That gives me Christopher. And we can see the query that is running. All all the ORM is doing is giving you methods that we could call on either the class or the instance to run a query for us. Right? Pretty simple, pretty easy way to understand what it's doing, but it's also really powerful. Right? Less so I have Christopher. I'm gonna save in I'm gonna save Christopher into a variable. So I'm gonna say Chris is player dot find two. So the variable Chris is whoever player dot find two will return to me, right? So if I just have Chris here, we have Chris, right? So let's update Chris's age to be something like twenty-seven. The method, as you imagine, is dot update, right? Dot update. And then we'll give a, we'll tell it which column we want to update, and I want the age to be updated to 27, right? And again, it runs the query for us, right? And if we do player dot all again, we could see that Christopher has been updated, and it automatically updates the update column as well for us, which is pretty neat. Um, next, let's find the player by another column, right? Is, so we talked about find, which will automatically go default to the ID column, but we could run the find by command, and this we could explicitly tell the column name and the value of the column to find that player. For example, if I want to find Christopher again, right, I'm going to say find by the name column, and I want it to be Christopher. Its value must be Christopher. Right, and then it returns that. So a couple of ways that we, you could you could find the player, for example. All right. So we went over the basics of what the ORM is doing, and when we get to relationships, this will get more complicated. But Rails will give you some neat little tools to make these complex queries a lot easier. Again, through the ORM. Right. But next, let's talk about the migrations. Right. I'm just gonna exit the console again. And you don't really have to exit the console. Usually I have the console open and then have the terminal here. But for for demonstrations, I'm closing and opening every single time for you guys. But let's talk about migration. So let me clear this. And we have, so when I ran migrate, right? Um, you guys didn't see this, but it created the schema.rb file. And this is your actual database, how it looks like, right? But let's say that we made a mistake and we need to have a last name table, right? And also we need the first name table. We don't want just to have the name. We want to save users first name and last name, right? So similar to this, we're going to create our migration files. To create a migration file is Rails generate migration or Rails G migration. And here, that's the name of the file that you're gonna that you're gonna create. The name of the migration file, similar to create players here. I'm gonna create, I'm gonna say add column last name. Alright? And two players. Alright? So I'm gonna run that. And you create a migration file. Right? And here we go. And we have the same change method. This method means change database. Right, and they're gonna run add column. So this is the migration method, right? The table name that we wanna change the column to. Remember the table name is plural, players, right? The column name is gonna be last name, right? And the type will be string, right? So I'm adding the column, adding a column to the players table. The column, what is the column? It's going to be the last name, and of course, we're going to tell we need to tell the type of the column it would be string. All right, so now let's run rate to be migrate. Right, so this is how we actually change the database. All right, we run rate to be migrate, 
And if we go to a schema, right, we can see that last name has been added. So let's go to the Rails console again. Enable herb. And we're going to do player.all. We can see that we have this last name. Or player.new. We can see that there's a last name column now. All right. But we still have this name column, so we must change it. We must change this to a string. Or not a string, it's already a string. We must rename it to first name. So let's exit this. Let's create a new migration. Rails G migration. Change or rename name column to first name All right it's good to be explicit because then whoever is reading this migration files will know exactly what is going to happen what, what exactly what it's doing all right let's run this migration and we have this in the change method we're gonna call this method called rename column we have to tell it which table players table and which column is going to be the name column and what we're going to change to first name All right so depending on the method this these get different the the arguments that you're passing to right but we could always go to a new window right and go to the migration documents migration ruby guys ruby on rails migrations and here it shows you how how to write a migration to create a table how to write a migration to change columns how to add foreign keys and all the t all the things that i'm showing you right now right obviously there are a lot more migration methods that you could run but i just wanted to show you a couple to, to tell you that you should never go into the schema file and change this directly you should always create a migration first and then run that migration right and that would handle the changing on the schema for you all right i wanted to show you another another cool little tool that you have right so which migrations do we know have been executed and which migrations do we know that have not been executed right looking at this file or this folder we have no idea right for example i haven't run this migration yet right but it's already saved in my folder okay how do we check again rails will give us a tool is rake db migrate status all right this will tell us which migrations are up and which migrations are down all right for example the two migrations that are already been executed they're up meaning they've been executed the one that is still pending is down all right i only recommend you to delete a migration file when it's down all right never delete a file a migration file when it's up only when it's down because then when you run a migration you won't be able to find it when it's and it's gonna the status will be up but then the file will be missing right so you always want to put it down first and then rename the column or or run the mic or delete the migration file so now that we know that it's one of them is down we could run the migration or rake db migrate right and it will run all the migrations that are down make make it up and if, if we see our schema we have the first one has been changed to first name the first one has been changed to last name right if we go back to the rails console herb.enable player.all right we can see that the first name ha have been changed right so Let's update the first player, player.first. That again, this gives me Eduardo, right? I'm gonna update. So remember, update was a method that we called on an instance, right? We first, in the example that I gave you, I said Chris equals to player.last, right? Or player.find2, right? Now Chris, it becomes an object, right? And then we could call the update on that object. Again, when I do player.first, that gives me an object. Since I have an object now, I can call update on that, right? And I can say last name is bake, right? 
the player dot all has been updated. Now let's update Christopher. Uh, player dot last dot update. Now I'll show you another syntax that you could do. Last name Barnes. All right. Player dot all. The reason why I showed you this syntax is for you to realize that all these things are hashes in Ruby, right? All the things are key and value pairs. So this syntax of having the last name colon uh, value, column name colon value, it is a synthetic sugar to actually this. All right. So it's just it's just a easier way to write things, right? It looks a little more like JSON. It's a little more readable. It's faster. So Ruby decided to update, or Rails decided to update their methods so that it supports this type of syntax. All right. So let me go back and run player dot all one last time. Everything looks good. Let's exit. But what if we made a mistake again, right? What if this migration file was wrong? And I don't want to change it in the first place. I ju every, everything's fine it's just as is, right? We could run a rollback. Uh, let me clear this. So uh, we made a mistake. The last migration was actually wrong. I'm going to say rake db rollback. This will roll back the last migration. And as you see, it says, hey, reverting the changes, right? They're no longer changed. If we go to schema, we can see that the last name is there, but the first name, the first name is gone and still the name column, whatever we had up to this point, right? If you want to change one more time, you could do rake db rollback one more time and revert the very, the, this one. Right, and if you look at our schema, now this is the original. You don't have to roll back twice like this. You could say rake db roll back step equals to whatever, right? But I'll let uh, I'll leave it up to you to figure that out. It's simply going to the migrations and reading the documentation and seeing how to run a rollback for an amount of times. All right, let's run rake db migrate status and see the status of our migrations these two are down right but actually my changes that I made they're correct so I'm gonna run a rake to be migrate here and leave it as how, how it was before we, we roll back all right cool our tables are good our table is good our schema file looks great in the next demo I will show you how to how to do associations and have relationships between tables so until next time Now that you have a model that's all hooked up and talking to your database, we want to make sure that, that what that model is sending to the database is correct. And Rails gives us something really great to do exactly that, validations. Exactly. So we never want to trust the input that comes from the user. It could be anything, even malicious. So let's run some validation code to make sure that the information that they send is correct and safe for a database. In Rails, validations are simple but yet powerful. Rail has a number of methods that allow us to check user input before we save anything, anything to the database. And it will also generate error messages, which is pretty neat. And we could just send that information to the user, say, uh, and we could just send the information back to the user so that they could correct the input. So it'll say like, hey, you typed in something that I wasn't expecting, or oh, I needed something more from you, things like that. Exactly. And that's already comes packaged up with whatever validation method you choose from Rails framework. Exactly. So let's go back to our player model that we created before, and let's add a validation. So we will add the validates method, and we'll choose the name and the age columns to be validated. Next, we'll add another argument saying the presence of those columns need to be true. By doing that, Rails will not allow any information that you try to add to the database without those two columns being provided, meaning they, do, they cannot be empty or nil. 
So essentially, validates is a method that Rails provides us. We give it what we're trying to validate as parameters, and then we choose from some predetermined types of validations. In this case, we're using the presence style of validation that checks that those columns do exist and are non-empty. Exactly. And it will also give you error messages like mentioned before. Next, let's do a demo of other types of validations and even how to create custom validations into our models. Perfect. Welcome back, everyone. In this demo, we're going to talk about validations. Validations are very powerful. Uh, validations will help us keep our data in our database very clean. It will make sure that only valid data is being inserted to the database. Because again, we never want to trust anything that comes from the user, right? So uh, we want to make sure that all of the data that we end up storing in our database, it's, a, it's valid and it's not harmful to us. All right, so let's let's go to the guides in for Ruby on Rails, and this is where you find a lot of documentation for validations. And I won't go over this because I'd rather show you guys how to validate things. But if you want to learn more about validations, there's a lot of informa good information here that you could definitely learn. But let's get to coding. So we. I have the league app again we're always going to be working on this app and let's run some validations all right generally there are two types of validations validations that run on new records and validations that run on existing records by default all the validations will be run on both but we could specify which validation we want to run depending if we're trying to enter a new uh, object into the database or if we're trying to update a new object to the database okay but first let's go over some of the simple validations that we could have uh, in the in the lecture I showed you guys a very simple validations which is the presence true all right so we're gonna have validates name so that's the attribute we're running the validates method on the attribute name and we're gonna say its presence must be true all right uh, this is this syntax here so the symbol hash rocket is the same thing as saying presence colon true all right so just a little shortcut now let's go to our rails console and let's try to enter a new a new player which is an invalid player so let's say the name attribute is not there. Oh, by the way, this is first name because we changed in the last in the last uh, demo. We we remember that we changed our schema so that we have first name and last name, correct? So let's make sure that a player always enters the first name, right? If they're trying to create a player, if the user is trying to create a player. So here. We have the same syntax, like let's create a new player object. And first, let's try to save this, or let's check if it's valid. Okay, so there's a method called valid question mark. All right, usually methods with a question mark in Ruby or in many other languages as well, we return a Boolean, right? So p dot valid question mark will give us either is this, is this object valid? Can we insert it to the database or can we not? Okay, and it's false, right? Because first name must be true, right? And we can also check the errors. Here we do p.errors.full underscore messages. p.errors, excuse me. And then it gives us the first name can be blank, right? So it's giving us some nice little messages here to tell us that the first name must must be present all right so let's let's insert a a let, let's say that the last name also must be present okay so we could either say validates last name presence true all right and to and whenever you make changes to the model file you must tell your rails console that you update it Right, that you may change it. We do that 
by doing the reload bang. Okay. Again, let's do p equals to player dot new, and let's run p dot valid question mark, false, and let's run p dot errors dot full underscore messages, and now we have first name can be blank and last name can be blank. So there's default errors for us that Rails will give, uh, depending on which validation you're running, right? And imagine if in a web application we're usually just gonna send this to the view, right, and just loop through it and display those messages unless you want the messages to change all right so we have that but this is kind of redundant right we're saying hey the first name the presence must be true and the last name can we make this in one line and the answer is yes right so if we say last name here just tag that on and we take that out let's reload and P. Uh, notice that I'm creating a new object every time when I'm reloading is because you cannot access the this object or whatever object you created before you reloaded, right? So when you reload, you have to create a new object again. P dot valid question mark is false. P dot errors dot full underscore messages. So same thing, right? So uh, first name can be blank and last name can be blank, right? Let's look at all the players that we have right now. Player dot all. Let's enable herb. Player dot all. Notice that Eduardo and Christopher they don't have a last name. All right, so I'm gonna say e equals to player dot first. All right, and I'm gonna try to update Eduardo uh, the first name attribute to something else. All right, so e dot update first name to be let's say let's say Martin. Okay. Now I'm going to try to run that, and notice that we get a rollback. Right, we're not able to to is to update this this entry in the database. Right, and the reason why is because we don't have a last name in there. Right, like I mentioned before, the validations will. By default, we run on both the create and the update. All right. So if we do p now e dot errors dot full underscore messages. All right. We we see that last name can be blank. So how can we make that the last name? The only time I want that validation to run that the last name must be present is when you create a player. Right. So let's not worry about. The validation of the last name when we're trying to update a player so let's say if you if you don't want a last name after you create your player then that's okay with this so let's go back here into our code and we're gonna say validates last name presence true And we're gonna say only on create. Okay, so remember, this is only gonna run only on create now. All right, so let's reload. Re, I think I spelled reload wrong. Okay, so we have that. Let's do the same thing. E equals to player dot first. So that's Eduardo, and we're gonna say E dot update first name to be Martin now and see how that worked updated the first person first player to be Martin the last name its presence is, is, tr is required to be true on create all right but let's let's put let's put last names for our players right now because I want them to have last names anyways so I'm gonna say player dot first dot update last name to be poo year and player dot last dot update last name to be Barnes. All right. So we have last names to everyone. Okay, that's great. All right, what about age? What about age? What about numbers? Right? We should we should be able to update that as well or to run validations as well. Okay, so Let's say validates the age 
column or the age attribute we call the numericality numericality validation and we're gonna say the number needs to be greater than zero but less than or equal to 100 okay so just gonna make sure that that the age are between the number one and a hundred inclusive on both sides all right so let's reload here so let's try to insert someone someone new into our database all right so I'm gonna say P equals to player dot new I'm gonna try to insert this person by calling the dot save P dot save we get a rollback rollback means it didn't get inserted into the database and now we could do P dot errors dot full underscore messages so we get this array of messages we get that age is not a number we could also say age its presence to be true right that would be a better error to to deal with instead of having something nil and then gives us another number error right let's reload this and let's do the same thing p equals to player dot new p dot save Roll back again, p full underscore messages. All right, this is a little better. Okay, now let's try to say, let's try to insert someone with a wrong age. All right, maybe so someone that puts an age that's negative. So, p dot first name. p dot last name. P dot age equals to negative five. So if you look at our P object, we have first name, age, and last name. I'm gonna call save on this. We get a rollback. Let's see why. P dot errors dot full underscore messages. And age must be greater than zero. Awesome. Now let's say P dot age is 110 and try to save that p dot errors dot full underscore messages now we get h must be equal to, must be less than or equal to 100 right so let's look at a p object so let's change this to be valid let's go back to 68 p dot h equals to 68 let's look at the p object everything looks good we need to save this into the database right and we're going to call p dot save and we get a commit transaction. Awesome. So everything's it's nice and clean. It's passing our validations. Now if we do player.all, we get all the players. One thing that I forgot to mention is that Rails by default will update your ID, will auto increment by one every time you insert something into the database, and also will update the created that and update that for you, which is really nice. Okay. So uh, these are just some of the some of the um, built-in validation that Rails comes with. So you could go go in here and learn. There's a there's a lot more to them. There's a lot more methods that you could run. But what about custom validations? All right. How about what if we want the first name of all the players to always be a a vowel? It must be a vowel. Okay. So we could write a custom method with a validation that will run to check the first letter of each of the first name. All right. So I'm going to say, let's write, let's go down here. Let's give us some room. And I'm going to say, write a method. First name starts with val. So remember that these are just instance methods now, right? We're inside of a class. And this is how you write an instance method, right? So this method will be available for each instance. So we could call that on the instance, right? So first, let's make our vowels array equals to a, e, i, o, u, right? And I'm gonna say unless vowels dot include Okay, and self. So remember, at in this case, self will be the instance, right? Self dot first name. 
zero dot down case. Okay, here I'm saying, let's change this to vowels, right? Is the first name of the object at that zero of index lowercase included in this array, right? If it's not, then I'm gonna add an errors. So add errors to the first name column must start with a vowel, okay, and end. All right, so hopefully this was not too confusing unless it's the opposite of if. So here I'm saying, again, it's the first name, it's the first letter of the first name, it's down case version included in the vowels array. If it's not, then add an error and, and run the validation or return an error. If, if it is, then we're good to go. And now here, I'm gonna call validate, okay, singular now, the first name, okay, and I'm gonna call the method. So here, just copy and paste that, all right? So we're saying the first name column must pass this validation, all right? So here, let's go back, let's reload, okay? Reload, let's take this out. I'm gonna say p equals to player dot new. Okay, let's do p dot first name, and let's have someone that does not have a that does not start with a vowel. Okay, so let's say Lance. All right, p dot last name equals to Robertson. Robertson p dot age is 77 let's look at the p object everything looks okay let's try to save and we get a rollback right let's do p dot errors dot four underscore messages and we get first name must we'll start with a vowel okay so there we go this is a custom validation the self here is actually optional the first name the validate first name it knows that we're trying to validate the first name attribute, right? So it will automatically assume that in here. So this will actually be the attribute that we're trying to reach into. So I'm gonna do the same thing here, reload, and I'm gonna do p equals to person dot new first name equals to last last name is Robertson, age is 77. Oh, it's player. Apologies, let me go back here. Let's try to save again. Same error, right? P dot errors dot four underscore messages. Now let's create a player that has the Right validation, so p equals to player dot new first name. I'm gonna call this a person. Sorry, I'm not very original, and I'm gonna call this last name. And age is one. Okay, so we see that p dot save. It commits player dot all, and we have that. Okay, so. Horrible names, but for the purposes of showing custom validations and validations that Ruby on Rails comes with, that's what I decided to pick. <laughs> All right, I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you next time. One thing that the Rails framework gives us that's really great is the ability to establish formal relationships between different models. And we do that with something called associations. Exactly. So associations are ways for us to relate the models between each other. So we're essentially re relating the tables that we have in our database and create a relationship so that we can retrieve data a lot easier using Active Record. For example, we have the has one relationship. A has one is a one to one relationship between models. Here I have a player and an address. So a player can only have one address. So we say in the player model, 
this player has one address. What we're doing that what we're doing there, we're creating a method called address that will call on the player object so that it will retrieve that player's address. Next, let's talk about the has many. This is the more this is a very common relationship that you'll be often used in your applications. So a team could have many players. That's a one-to-many relationship. How do we set that up in our models? Here we have the class team has many players, and the class player belongs to team. By doing this, we create a method for the team object called dot players, and a player, and then a team method for the player object. So I'm essentially defining in my team that they are going to have many players, but I also have to, in my player method, say, hey, you only get one team. Exactly. So we could go and find the first player in our database and call the dot .team method, which Active Record will write a query to retrieve that specific player's team name or team object. Reversely, we could find the, the team. OK, can we start that again? Yeah. So I was like, you got to define it in the team, and you got to define it in the players. They only have one team. Exactly. So for example, we could go and find the first team and call the dot players method, and that will retrieve all the players that belong to that specific team. And Active Record will do that for you. Reversely, we could find the first player and call the dot team method, which will retrieve the team that that player belongs to. So associations is a way for us to define easy to access methods in each of our classes. And Active Record, because of the relationship, knows how to go and get that information. Yes. So next, we'll talk about the many-to-many -many relationship. And that is set up with the through. To create a many-to-many -many relationship, we have to use the through methods. In this example, we have a player class and a game class. So a player could be part of many games. But also, the game could have many players. To keep track of which player playing which game, we'll create a new model called appearance. And that appearance will, will have columns for the player and the game. Those columns usually will be the IDs to refer back to which player played in each game. Imagine, we will, that appearance table is really important because that's what we're going to use to make a join. Or act, that's what Active Record will use to join the player in the game. And how, to, how do we set that up in the player class and the game class? We simply say a player has many appearances, and a player has also many games through appearances, and the opposite will go for the game. Uh, the game has many appearances, and uh, the game has many players through appearances. And then in the appearance model, we say that this model belongs to a player, and also it belongs to a game. So then there's only one appearance, and for each appearance, it has one player in one specific game. But then by using the through method, we're creating a relationship through all these many different things to say, hey, like when a pay player appears at a, has an appearance, it's at a specific game, and there can be so many of those, but we've got a specific pipeline all the way from player through to which game they played in. Exactly. Next, I'd like to do a demo on associations. Sounds good. Welcome back, everyone. In this demo, we're going to talk about associations. So, uh, mainly, we're going to talk about the has one, the has many, and the has many through associations. So associations are a way to set up the model, the models in your application to connect and create relationships. For example, if a player has a team, and a team has many players, how can we get that information? By setting up associations, Active Record will give us methods that we could call on to query that information very easily. First, let's go over an example of the has one association. So uh, I like to use address. For example, a player can only live in one place at a time, so a player only has one address, right? So we already have the player model. If you guys remember from the last demo, we have the player model. I'll take this out. We don't need this custom validation anymore. Let's take that out, but I'll leave the other ones. Okay. And let's create a 
a address model now. So Rails generate model address and I'll keep it very simple. Uh, it's going to be street. Uh, it's going to be a string and let's just have street for now and player references. Player references all it's going to do is create a player underscore ID column in the addresses table to reference to the player model because we need to keep track of which player lives in the address. So this is what that will do. All right. So let's run the model generator. There we go. If we look at our DB schema, not schema, our migration file, we see that we have a references, right? It's just a foreign key to the player table. Let's look at the address. So when we run player references, Rails will automatically put this belongs to player. And all this does is create a instance method on the address model to query a player that belongs to the address. Okay, that's what it automatically do. It will do a belongs to player. All right, so to to see how this actually works, let's run the migration and let's get into our console. Rig to be migrate to actually create the table. Good. So our schema it should create the addresses table. Let's run Rails console. Uh, I'm gonna enable her and this is all the players that we have and let's do player.all and let's do address.all obviously we don't have anything there address.new oh spell address wrong address.new so we could create create an address and tell which player the address belongs to right so let's have uh, let's create a new address address dot create street will be one two three example road and player ID will be one okay so we create a new address address dot all there we go so remember what I said before that the belongs to creates an instance method on the address model, right? Called player. So an instance method, it, I could call on instances. So address dot first is an instance of the address model, right? This is an instance of the address model. Let me disable herb real quick. Uh, herb dot disable address.first is an instance, is an object, right? So I could do address.first the player to retrieve the player that belongs to that address, right? The, the player that lives in that address. So address.first, again, this is an instance. Now I have an instance method called dot player that retrieves the player that lives in the address. Right, let me go back to herb.enable and just the first dot player, right? Or I could do something like a equals to address dot first. So a equals to the first instance of the address model. Now a dot player who belongs to that address is Martin, right? It's it's not just Martin, is the Martin is the object that has the first name Martin, last name player, and all this thing. This is also an object, right? So I hope that the belongs to is clear. But again, we're trying to have a has one relationship. The belongs to just tells me who belongs to the address. But how? what if I want to have, what if I want to know which address that player has, right? So again, it's very similar to, to adding this line. We're gonna automatically add that line to the 
to the class as well, but not the has, not, not the belongs to, in this case will be the has one, okay, has one address. All right, so now we're saying, hey, the player class, we're going to create an instance method called address that will retrieve the address that the player has. And, it's, and that player cannot have more than one. It's only one address. Okay. Every time we make changes to the model, we need to reload. Reload. Okay. And I will... Now I could do the other way, right? Which address does the player one has, right? So player dot all again, we have this. Let's say p equals to player dot first. The, so the variable p equals the first player object. And p dot address, right? What is your address, player one, player dot first? Is one, two, three, as example wrote. Okay? So let's create another player. I mean, let's create another address. Uh, address dot create. Actually, let me go back real quick. So I want to show you guys a couple ways that you create a, an address or any object in the database. So that has a relationship in here. I said address dot create street one, two, three example road player underscore ID equals to one. Uh, you could also pass the whole object. So uh, I'll show you what I mean by that. Let's create another address address dot create. Uh, street is four, five, six. Test testing avenue. Player not player ID equals to player dot third. Okay, so notice that now I'm passing the whole object for into the query, and Rails will automatically figure it out that you're trying to pass the ID. Okay, and see how we uh, commit the transaction, right? Player ID equals to three. So a couple ways that you could you could create things that has relationships, right? So uh, one way is to create relationship is to pass the actual ID, but then you had to say player underscore ID equals to the number. The other way is just to say player and pass the whole player object. Now I could do address dot second dot player that should give me the third player and then player dot third dot address all right so that's the has one relationship and also we went over the belongs to and next we'll go over the has many or one to many relationships all right so i'll see you next time hello everyone in this demo, we'll go over the one-to-many relationship. In Rails, it's the has-many relationship. So we'll be creating a relationship between player and teams. So a player belongs to a team, but a team has many players. For example, in soccer, uh, the, there's, there are 11 starting players and 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 reserves on a team. Right, so we're gonna set up relationships so that we could always access which which team a player belongs to, and all the players that are in a team. So first, let's create a team model. Let's go back to our terminal, and I'm gonna exit the console here. Let me clear this out, and back to our our model creation rules generate or G model team and uh, the team will have a name that'll be all right uh, there we go let's go back to our migration it looks good the team looks good let's rate db migrate good so when we create a has many relationship we also need to keep track which team a player belongs to. So we need to add a column in the player table, in the players table that will have team underscore ID so that we could access the team to that player column, right? So similar to what we did before for the address, 
which has in our schema which has the player ID we need the players table to have a team ID so that we could track keep track of the team that the player belongs to right so first we need to create a migration file remember we're always trying to create migration files to change our schema here I'll type rails generate migration and I'm going to call this add add team reference to uh, player okay and I'm gonna say what what I'm trying to add I'm gonna try to add team references all right so remember that we could have migration files and we could write the migrations ourselves but we could also say things like this I want to add a team reference in the migration and will automatically create that code for us in the migration file so if I go to migration file now it automatically added this code for me right I could have typed this out right I could have just literally just typed this out from scratch but it's a little easier to just do it to the terminal sometimes right so this is how you add a reference to the players table the team and index true and foreign key true okay let's rate db the migration rate db migrate now if you look at our schema we have the team id right so if we go to a console uh, user uh, player dot all that's her dot enable player dot all you have the team id column okay so how can we set up the relationships similar to uh, the has one and the belongs to a player will belong to a, pl a team right so a player belongs to a team again this is creating a instance method that will call on this column right that will look at this column and figure out which team that player belongs to right now the team has many players so here we're going to write team has many and we're going to say players and it, this method this instance method will query all the team all the players of the specific team okay so first let's create some teams team.all team.new let's say team.create name will be uh, uh, LA Lakers team dot create name will be LA Clippers team dot create name um, Boston Celtics okay so we have three teams and let's assign some players that we already have to those specific teams. So uh, I'm going to say Martin and Christopher, they both belong to the Lakers. Eduardo belongs to the Clippers. And a, a person, last name, belongs to the Celtics, right? So let's do March, uh, player dot first dot update team underscore ID will be one right that's the lakers id that worked right we could also do player the second the update team team the first right almost the same thing oh unknown attribute team hmm i guess that doesn't work for the updating let's go back here let's just update the normal way team ID that will be one okay so now player dot all we have team ID one and two and one for Christopher and Martin I will assign Eduardo to team ID two player dot third dot update team ID equals to two and player dot last dot update team ID three 
Okay, player dot all. Everything looks good. So once we put these things in our models and we reload, okay, we could call these methods, right? So I want to know which team Martin belongs to or the first player. So player dot first dot team and it queries the information, right? We could see that it's selecting the team where the team ID equals to one because Martin or player dot first, the team ID is one, right? Now we could do the same thing from the team side. So again, team dot all, I'm gonna select the first team, T equals to team dot first, right? Now the method here is dot player. So team dot uh, T dot players will query all the players that belong to that team. So those are two players. So we could see the query that it does. So from the players table, right? Select all the information where the players dot team ID equals the same ID of T, right? Or team dot first. Uh, I could just chain that here. Team dot first dot players it will be the same thing. Now team dot second dot players should be Eduardo, right? Because there's only one player there, but could be many players, right? Team dot third dot players, very similar. It will be only one person right now because only one person belongs to that team, right? So this is how you create a one-to-many relationship. And by writing these methods here in our models, it creates instance methods that are, are that will query the information that we need very easily. So very powerful and also pretty easy to implement. And I hope this was this was helpful to you. So next we'll create the has many through relationships. All right, so I'll see you next time. Welcome back everyone. The last association that we're gonna cover is the has many through. The has many through association is used to connect uh, another model in a many to many relationship. We're gonna have a third table that's gonna be the through model, right? We're gonna create a model that is gonna have a third table that will hold on to the IDs of the first model to the connecting of the second model and vice versa. In a many to many relationship, you usually have a, a middle table that will hold on to the IDs of both things that you're trying to relate to. So the example that we had in the in the lecture is the game model, right? So a player could have many games. In a season, a player will play many games, but a game itself has many players. So we'll create an appearance model and to keep track of which player appeared in which game. So let's let's do that. First, let's create the game model. So let me clear this. Rails G model game. And we're gonna have the home string. So here it's gonna be the home home team and then the away team. Okay, that's all we're gonna keep track of. This is for this for this to learn migrations and models for now. Okay. So Rails G model game home string. That looks good. And we're going to create a appearance table or appearance model appearance. And that will keep track of the player and the game. So it's going to have a player references and a game references. Now I'm going to migrate that rig to be migrate. So we can see that the appearance model, it belongs to a player and belongs to a game. And here in the player model, we're going to have to write that this player has many appearances and this player will also have many games through the appearances. So let's write that. So the player has many appearances. 
appearances and it has many appearances through or has many games sorry games through appearances so that's the middle table we to get to all the games that this player has played we have to go through the middle table right that's how we're going to keep track of is a many to many now uh, similar in the game model has many players or oh, has many appearances sorry appearances has many players through appearances right okay so let's go to our reels console let me erase some of this let's do player dot all herb dot enable player dot all we have that game dot all is empty game dot new home and away and we have appearance dot new we have the player ID and the game ID so let's create a couple games I'm gonna say let's do team dot all first okay I'm gonna say that the Lakers will play the Clippers and the Lakers will play the Celtics at home and then the Celtics will play the Lakers when the Celtics will be at home all right so first I'm gonna say appear uh, game dot create home will be the LA Lakers away will be the Boston Celtics I know uh, we could have put the home and away as a reference to the team right we could have done that but this this demo is more for the many to many right it's not about the game having a reference to the to the teams is about the game and the players having a relationship between each other and keeping track of the relationship through the appearance table now they're just there will just be strings okay so we have that and I'm gonna say the Lakers will also play the Clippers all right and I'm gonna say that the Celtics played the Lakers but then it was in Boston. Okay, now we have three games, game dot all. So every time a player plays, right? Every time we have a player appear in a game, we have to say this player appear in a certain game. So in the appearance table, again, it's empty now here press the new uh, I'm gonna say that the the first player the first two players play in the first game so appearance dot create player ID the first player play in the first game and also the second player play in the first game and let's have the third player play in the second game and the fourth player play in the fourth game or in the third game I mean so player number three play in game number two and player number four player playing game number three so appearance dot all nice so remember so these are instance methods so for we, we're seeing here a game has many appearances and it has many players through the appearances so we could see what players played in each game so game dot first dot players we get Martin and Christopher because what's happening is that it's going through this table appearance and checking the first the game ID that we have right game dot first that ID is one right 
that ID is 1, right? So in the appearance table, it's checking all the players that have a game ID of 1, right? And then it retrieves those things for us. You can see the query here game ID of 1. So now we know all the players that played in the first game. Or And now, uh, reversely, we could say, hey, I want to know all the games that the first player has played. So let's say uh, that the first player also played in the third game. Okay, so let's create a new appearance. And let's say player ID 1 also played in game 3, right? Players could play multiple games. Now if I go to player.first, right, the first instance of the player and check the games that this person played, we see that he played in the home game for the Lakers and the away game for the Lakers, right? And that makes sense. A player could play multiple games. So this middle table is very important because it keeps track of all the appearances. That's why we named the appearance. It keeps track of who played where and when. And by setting up our model with these two things, has many appearances and has many games through appearances, and then has many appearances and has many players through appearances, we are, we are telling Rails to when we call this method, go through this middle table, check the values that make sense for us in this instance, and return that for us. So, so that's how you create a many-to-many -many relationship uh, through Active Record and in Rails. So I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you next time. Now that we've learned all about the model, let's pay more attention to the view of the controller parts of the MVC framework. In this, we're going to not just tell you what the view and the controller are, but show you as we make a whole new app. Exactly. The best way to learn is by actually coding. So in this application, we're going to create the models, the controllers, and the views and tie them all together to create an app. Here on the slide, we're going to create a CRUD application. CRUD means creating, reading, updating, and deleting, or destroying. And we're going to follow the RESTful convention or, or RESTful routes. So we're going to tie the seven unique actions, index, new, create, edit, update, and destroy to their own unique HTTP verb to create our application. Rails will also give us awesome error messages. And every time we try to do something, it will tell us that, that we've done them wrong, so we need to fix it. So we're going to follow the errors and fix the code accordingly so that the errors disappear. Sort of like TDD but by following the messages that Rails would tell us. So in TDD, we write unit tests, and then we have those unit tests fail, and then we write the code to get them to pass. In this, we're going to show you the errors, and then we're going to write the code to make those errors go away. Exactly. So next, I would like to show you how to display a list of players. In this demo, let's create a page that displays all the players. The URL the URL for that page will be slash players. The controller will be players, the action index, and it's going to be a get request. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, in this part of the course, we'll be creating an application, a whole new application. We've been working with this leaf application, but I want to create a, I want to start from scratch. And the reason why we're going to be going over all the errors that you might see when you develop, and we're going to follow the errors to solve and build our app, right? So we just we just went over the RESTful routes and the CRUD action. So each in each section, we'll be going over one CRUD action, and we're gonna we'll be writing the views for it, and we'll be writing the controllers and the models. All right. So let's create a new application, Rails new, and I'm called this the association. Awesome. I'm going to go into, into it. I'm just going to drag it over here so you guys can see it. The association. So I'm going to open this in Sublime. All right, and we have this open here. 
and let's turn our real server okay real server just gonna open a new one and if we go to localhost 3000 right we can see the app is working right so if when we go to so there we go so if you remember the first route right that we should go is the slash players right that is the page it's gonna render all the players right so let's try to do that first right if you go to local slash players we're gonna see that no route get players matches anything that we write right so we get this routing error right slash players we don't have anything matching to slash players this error this routing error is often solved in the config route star b file if we go to back to our sublime back to our application if we go to config routes this is where you're gonna write all the routes that you need right so we have seven restful routes all seven of them will be in here right so these are all comments you could definitely read through it but i'm gonna erase it okay and we're gonna say get if you remember there the get that's the action the http verb get slash players here you could omit the slash will route so usually we want controllers to be uh to be plural right and and we're gonna have actions in those controllers right so we're gonna say get slash players will go to the players controller the index method okay now let's refresh and let's see what error we get right we get initialized players controller so this error is telling us that we don't have a players controller yet okay so let's create a players controller let's go back to our terminal and I'm going to create same same as the model we're going to type rails generate controller and I'm going to call players all right So we create players. Now if we go to app controllers, we see the players controller file here. All right, so class players controller inherits from application controller. Okay. Now if we go to our, back to our browser, we're gonna refresh now. Now we say, now we see that no index action index in the players controller, right? And that goes back to the route. We're saying get players, the route get players is routed to the players controller, the index method. Okay. Now, if we go back to the players controller and we write def index and just an empty method, an empty index method, and I refresh, we get another error template missing. Okay. So, template missing is the view. It's a view that is related to this action, right? So if you go to views, we have a players folder. So when we ran the generator in our terminal, it created this players folder, app views players, right? So that's where all the views associated to this controller will be saved in, right? So let's create a view called index.html.erb index.html.erb all right erb is the templating engine that rails uses it allows us to write ruby code in html okay so i'm gonna have an h1 here and this is the view file coming from the players controller index method all right now i'm gonna go back to our browser if I refresh we will see that we have the view file rendering so how does how does real know automatically that when we say the routes how does it find the players controller here and when we goes to the index method how does it know to render the player the index html.erb inside the players folder 
right? So Rails will find that through the file names. Notice in the controller file name, we have players underscore controller. So we'll find the players controller to that. And the view will automatically render a HTML file, HTML.erb file that matches the name of your method. Okay, so that's how you find this. So if I change this to whatever, and I change my index.html.erb to whatever.html.erb, so you can see right here I'm changing the file. Okay, and I go back to my view. I refresh. Oh, now we get a writing error, right? So instead of that, I'm going to say goes to whatever still works, right? So it's all about the file names, right? So make sure that uh, you, your file names are correct at all times. Okay, go back and see what could be going on. Okay, index, and let's change everything back to index, rename, index.html.ib. All right, so uh, let's write some code. Let's write some HTML. We this page is supposed to be a page to to display all all players, right? So first, I'm gonna have a h1 here that's gonna say there are four. I just I'm just gonna say uh, I'm just gonna have a placeholder. There are a number of players in our league, okay? League, and I'm gonna have a table. I'm gonna have a table head. I'm gonna have a row for this and a, a couple of things in here. I'm gonna have first name, last name for now, okay? Let's just have that, that for now. And then I'm gonna have a table body and first, I'll just like to have the HTML first, right? Uh, I'm going to have the first name to be uh, Martin Pouillier. And then I'm going to have another for TD. I'm going to have Christopher Burns. Burns. I'm going to have a TR, TD, and I'm going to have Eduardo. Like, right? And let's see how that looks like. Let's go back here. And we're at this table, right? We have, there are a number of players in this league. Martin Puyer, Christopher Burns, Eduardo Bake, right? So there are three players, there are three players in the league right now. Okay? But this is all hard coded, right? This is the, we're not interacting with the database right now. We're not interacting with our models. So how can we have this information instead of come instead of hard coding it like this, how can we have it coming from our database? Right? So if I have this index method, interesting that I just, it used to be whatever, and I put index here. And how was it already automatically loading this page? Is that this route, if we have an index.html.ab file, this route will automatically load that page. But we, but it's not going through a method before. Right? So let's do this again, whatever. You notice that this route still works, but this works because we don't need anything from the model, but we will need an index method that will render that page if we want to pass information from our controller to the view. So remember that the controller controls things, it's going to be talking to our model and the view. So in our index method, so let's write that, let's put index again, and I'm going to I have something um, interesting here, and just bear with me for now. I'm gonna do players dot player dot all right. Uh, this is an instance variable, and this instance variable is gonna get all the information from a player model, right? All the players that we have in the player model, 
right? So we should know what player dot all will give us now. But if we refresh here, we're gonna get initialize constant players controller player. We're trying to reach into a player model that doesn't exist. Okay, so let's create that player model. Uh, Rails G model player first name string last name string okay let's wait to be migrate that and if we refresh now we shouldn't get any errors because now there is a model called player in our database right so let's create a couple players in our in our console player dot create first name will be Eduardo last name will be fake and let's have Puyer Martin and let's have player dot create first name Chris and last name Barnes all right oops something went wrong I spelled create wrong okay player dot all we have this array of players so this command is what is getting saved in our add players, right? Add players, this variable is holding an array of objects, an array of players, right? So we could access this variable in the view. In here, what I'm gonna do is have some Ruby code. So we have ERB, right? This dot erb extension allows us to write ruby code in the view All right and how do we start our erb tag is by doing the caret percent sign remember the, the variable players at players is available here so at players i'm going to use a enumerator dot each do and i'm going to say player right this block variable and I want to reach, I want all of these rules to repeat. I'm going to leave the first one, but I'm going to erase this too because we don't need it anymore. And close the loop. But for each TD, I'm going to say, hey, give me the player dot first name and the player dot last name depending on how many players I have in this array, right? I'm going through each one and printing out the first name and the last name. So notice that in this tag, I don't have the equal sign. Here, I'm not trying to print anything. I'm just trying to put some Ruby code. When I put the equal sign, that means print out what's in here. It's like saying puts. So print the values of each player, the first name and each player, the last name. Let's go back to our view and refresh. Now we see that this is coming from the database, right? So if we add one more person in our database, first name, last, last name, Robertson. Okay, I'm gonna refresh the page now. And we see that Lance Robertson it's in our database, which in turn is getting put into the view to the controller, right? So let's go over what what's happening again. So we have the routes, config routes, saying that the slash players route goes to the players index method. Now the controller, right, controls things. We have this variable at players, which talks to the model and and gathers all the players in an array. So and we send that to the to the view, 
right? In the view, we have access to that uh, instance variable, right? We're looping through that array and printing out each player. That's what we get. One last thing, we have three players, right? So how can we make that more dynamic, right? Instead of hard coding three, we have the variable at players. We could say, hey, we have players dot count like that. Okay. Now that should turn to four. Okay. So this is the players index demo. I hope it was helpful and I'll see you for the next one. In this demo, we're going to create a page with a form to add a player to our database. The URL for that page will be slash player slash new. The controller again will be players. The action this time will be new and it's also a get request. Welcome back everyone. So we're going to continue writing an application. The next action is players new. So from this page, how would you get to there, right? We need an anchor tag, a, a link tag that will link to the players new URL. Let's implement that. Let's go to our sublime anchor tag slash players slash new, new player and refresh. And if I click this, try to guess what error would I get? I'll give you a second or two. And here we go. If you guess no routing matches get players new, you are absolutely correct, right? I clicked on the anchor tag. It made a request to my server, right? And my server couldn't understand because I don't have anything telling it that we, we were supposed to listen to that route. So let's let's tell it to let's tell it to listen to that route in the routes file. Uh, another get request to players new, and that will go to players new method. Now if I refresh, no action new. Okay, so I could go to the player controller, add the new method. And if I refresh, uh, try to guess what area it is. It is the no template, template missing. Now I could create a new .html.erb file inside the players folder. And I'm gonna have an h1 here, create a new player. Okay, so I'm gonna refresh here and we're gonna create a new player here. Right, so see how the file will get loaded. So let's create a form. Okay, let's create a form. Form the action here will be slash players. Okay, the method will be post, and we're gonna need a label for the first name. Input type text name is player first name. We don't need a value. Same thing for the last name player last name. And I have the name attributes like this for a reason, and I'll explain this in the next video. But for now, just follow along with me. And the very last one is the input type. Input type submit name will, will be, we don't need a name in here. Let's just have uh, create. Okay, let's see how it looks like. And we have our form, very simple. Uh, no CSS styling, obviously, but we're trying to learn how Rails works right now. So uh, this is for the players new and I'll see you next time. In this demo, we're going to create the action of submitting the form to add a new player to the database. This action's URL will be slash players. It will go to the player's controller, the create method, and this time the HTTP verb will be post. Welcome back everyone. Next, we're gonna do the players create action. So the action of submitting the form. So if we go back to our code, we have this form, it's gonna to go to slash players. I spelled that wrong. Players, met the post. We have this label first name, the text, 
the name is player first name then we have the last name player last name submit create all right so what's going to happen when we submit the form okay so hopefully you guys know by now that it's going to be no route match players let me refresh this since i changed the html all right no route matches post players okay so let's go back to our routes we could write post players goes to players create so notice that we have two routes essentially that are named the same however because of the http verb we're going to be able to go to different methods even though the url is the same okay so i'm going to refresh now no action create okay uh, let's go to our controller and i'm going to write dev create uh end and then if i refresh let's there'll be no invalid authenticity token so this is a new error okay invalid authenticity token so this is for uh, cross-site request forgery so uh, every time you post something rails will give you a token okay not every time but uh, per session rails will give you a token that will be unique okay and that is to make sure that the person posting this information is the current person in session no one could just steal your session and post it as if it were you so what what can we do we could add that authenticity token into our form so let's go back to our code here i'm gonna have input type is hidden we don't want it to show the name field is authenticity token and the value is ruby tag form underscore authenticity token okay uh, let's go back here refresh and try to create again we get the template missing error that we were used to right not the crazy error that we just saw so let me just show you guys if i go to inspect element and i open this form we have the authenticity token so this is getting passed into into our controller into our back end so let's fill out some information here i'm gonna try to create a new player i'm gonna say coding dojo and how can i see the information inside of the form how can i see the post information so one way that you could do this is by writing fail when this request comes to the to the back end to the controller rails is going to stop executing and it's going to show you a page with the fail message so let's try it fail it tells us that it failed but we see that the parameters are it's a hash it's a ruby hash right there's the key authenticity token and there's the value here of the authenticity token and there's a key player which is also a hash so how will we create a new player? We've been creating new players essentially uh, this whole time, right? In our console, but how do we do it in the in the context of of a web application? We should think about it. If we have validations, how can we show the user that they messed up, that they need to fill the validations correctly? First, let's go to our player model and let's quickly add validations validates first name last name and a simple validation and the presence to be true okay so all of it needs to be true let me change the syntax real quick okay the first name and the last name their presence must be true all right so i'm gonna say something like this i'm gonna say player equals to player dot new and we will have to do player dot first name equals to so the params is a hash right so you see there's a hash so we could go into this hash go to the player key and go to the first name key to get the coding value params player first name 
right? First name, player dot last name, same thing equals to params player last name. All right? If the player is saved, if saved, save is gonna return a boolean, true or false, was I able to save or not? I want to redirect to this route slash players okay else i want to redirect to slash player slash new but i also want to add some error messages some flash error messages so one way they could do this is access the flash hash inside we're going to say errors and all i'm going to do is say player dot errors dot full underscore messages right remember this we tried this in when we're going over validations right so i'm going to save all the error messages in this errors key in the flash let's see if that works first of all so i'm going to go back here if i'm going to click create and i should be redirected to this page right and that's what it seems like if I go to code and if I add a new person, coding dojo, oops, I apologize, it's re redirect to. Okay, let's retry. Let's just go to slash players and see how coding dojo has been added. So let's do it one more time. Let's add another person. Let's add uh, Kelvin Blue. These are all my coworkers. Create, and there we go right so we have we have all of this working see how the number is getting dynamic so what if something goes wrong how can i show the flash error messages here in our new html i'm gonna have some ruby logic if flash errors if flash errors exist remember in ruby nil and false are only the falsy values, right? If it exists, then I'm going to loop through it. Flash errors dot each do E. And I'm going to show in a P tag. Each error. We want to do this if statement because in the first load, see that like, it shouldn't show anything, right? I'm reloading every, uh, every time. So I'm making the request again. It shouldn't show anything. And that works because I have this if statement. If we didn't have this if statement and we just had this part right here, it would try to access this flash errors, uh, but it, it doesn't exist. Right, we didn't set it to anything. See, there's there's no each method for something that doesn't exist, for something that is nil. Right, so we had to make sure that flush errors exist first to be able to loop through it. So let's go back here, let's refresh, and there we go. Right, so if I click create and the validation doesn't doesn't show, and the validations show, right, the validations run, and then it shows the, uh, the message here. Okay, so that's how you create a a player. But notice that I create a new player object, and I'm adding and I'm changing its attributes uh, like this, right? So what if the player object has multiple attributes, has mu multiple columns? What if it's not just first name and last name? Is it's many things? You could imagine that this is not very good. You wouldn't want this to be, uh, for example, a six lines of code. That will look very, very messy. And oftentimes, one method is creating multiple things. This is not sustainable at all. Rails allows mess assignment and also allows whitelisting parameters or strong parameters. So there's a reason why in the new page, right, we set the name attributes of the input fields to be in this format because now in the controller i could create a private method 
and this private method will be called player params okay and this method will would whitelist the params that I want to be added to my database uh, Params. so this is a little bit long but just bear with me and type along with me params dot require the player hash okay remember there's a player hash with the first name key and the last name key only permit the first name and the last name don't allow anything else coming from the user okay make sure that we're only permitting the first name and the last name or whatever else you're trying to add into the database okay now we will do mass assignment meaning i could just pass that whole method this will return a hash with those values right into here and i don't have to manually change each attribute okay so let's see if it works first name let's call it kevin kim okay create and there we go okay if i try to create a new player without validations it doesn't work all right so this is the players create and i'll see you next time after creating a player we should be able to see a player's profile page so in this demo we're going to create a page that will display all the information of a specific player the url for that will be slash players slash whatever id the player is saved in the database the controller will be players and the action will be show again the http verb will be get Welcome back everyone. In this demo is the player show demo. So we need to create a, a page to display all the information, all the information of the player. Let's go back to our code in our app views players index.html. I'm going to add another TD here, another header, and this is going to be called actions. So all the actions that we could uh, act on to see player information. And in here, I'm going to create another TD, and this TD needs to be a link. And the link will be show of this player. If I refresh, I'll just put a pound for now. If I refresh my web page, uh, the point of this is to when I click the show, it would it will go to this player's show page. So let's go to our console. Let's go to real C. And herb.enable. Or maybe I didn't add herb here. So it's fine. Let's do player.all. Okay. That gives us an array of objects. And each object has their own ID. So that's what we're doing here. App players comes from the controller. We send it to the view. And all we're doing in the view is looping through that information. The player here symbolizes each player. And so here I have that as well. The URL is players slash players slash player dot ID. Now, if I go back to my URL, we inspect element body the table the body if you look at each row players one if you look at the next one it should be players two the next one players three and their own unique id that's good now we could now we could get the information dynamically so let's go and click on a action. So let's go to coding dojo, click show. We get get players five. So we're familiar with that information, right? We know what to do. Go to config routes, get players. And here we're going to have a placeholder. The placeholder starts with the colon and the name of the placeholder. Here I'll call this placeholder id because that's what it is it's just a unique number in their database and that will go to players players show method 
Okay. Now if I refresh this, no action show in the player's controller. So we'll add a dev show and here, and I'm going to write fail. Okay. So refresh here, fail, this is going to fail right there and show us that the ID is coming into the params hash. So if I go to my routes and change this placeholder name to placeholder, placeholder name, and I refresh the, the web page, we're going to see that that name gets changed, right? So this is just the name of the placeholder and we name it ID because that's exactly what it is. So if I take out the fail now, I want you to guess that this is the error. We should get used to the errors that we're going to see when we're developing now. How do we create a template for this page? Go to the show, go to the players folder, new file, show.html.erb, show, save that, and going to go to h1. This is the show page for this particular user. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, we have, we have, we are able to go from the, from this page to the show page. But now notice that this is just hard coded information. We need to be able to send particular information to the template. So that information needs to come from the controller. So let's go back to our code in our controller and in the price controller in the show method, remember this is how you send information to the view. So here I'm going to say app player equals to, and here's where we could do a query. We could find the player by their ID. So params ID. And now that will be available in the view. For example, I could say this is the profile page H1. This is the profile page for a player the first name. Okay, so let's refresh now. Go back to the show map then. Now it's working. Okay, there we go. So it's, it's becoming more dynamic. All right, so let's add a little more HTML into this page. So let's write table uh, T head. And I'm going to have a TR first name. Last name. And then a T body. Uh, TD. And then here, all we're going to display is the player dot first name. And another one for the last name. Okay. And we'll add more things later, but for now, let's just keep it simple. And I'm going to create a link to go to the home page. Let's go to the home page. And you know that that link is slash players for now. Okay. So let's refresh, go to the show. That's what we have. Go back to the home page, and our website is becoming a little more dynamic. And uh, we are able to connect the pages now, knowing which URLs we need. All right. So this is the show page, and I'll see you next time. In this demo, we're going to create a form to add a specific player. The URL will be slash player slash whatever ID of the specific player in the database, slash edit. The controller will be players. The action will be edit. And the HTTP request will be get. Welcome back, everyone. So next, we're going to create the edit page. So first, we need to create an action for it. Let's go back to our code in our index.html.arb. I'm going to have a pipe here. And very similar, the URL now will be player slash the player ID slash 
edit. Yeah, we're gonna say edit. Let's write show profile and edit profile. Let's save this. Let's see how it looks like. Now, if I click on it, obviously we get a routing error. Players one slash edit. That's the error, right? So let's go back to our to our code. Let's go to our routes now. Edit, not edit. Sorry, get players slash id slash edit goes to players edit. If we refresh, no action edit could be found. So we go to the controller, we create an action that edit and we refresh template missing. So we go to views players folder new file edit.html.uib h1 this is the edit page let's refresh now and there we go edit profile for this player so on and so forth so notice how the url is changing awesome so since we have this guy right here this placeholder id we will also have that available in our edit method or edit action so let me fail it and if we look at here we have the id one for kevin kim we have the id seven awesome so now i could say add player equals to player dot find params id very similar to the show and send that player and we're sending the player to the edit page. So here is, this is, we could say, edit, add player, the first name, information. And there we go, edit Chris's information, edit coding dojo, coding's information, okay? Eduardo's information. So I have that. Now we could create a form to to edit the page. So I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna go to the new and it's gonna be very similar to this. Edit and players post and I'm gonna say I'm gonna add one more thing here, info type hidden name is underscore method next is patch so i'll explain what this does uh, in the next video when we actually create the update action but for now all we want to care about is having the information in the view this is this is what the edit action does it all all it does is display the view with the form to to update the player and we can also maybe put a value here and have and have the player the first name and maybe have the form pre-filled already okay let's go back here let's refresh and there we go so everything looks okay let me create a new link here let's same thing to this add a new so it's going to go to gonna go to slash players and let's say uh, go back there we go so not the previous website right now but it's getting there there's all that functionality next uh, we'll talk about how to actually update the information in this demo, we're going to create the action of submitting the form to edit a player. The URL of the action will be slash player slash ID. The controller again will be players. The action will be update and the HTTP verb will be patch. Welcome back everyone. So let's update a profile. We're here and I want to change this uh, first name, let's say to Edu. Okay. Remember, Last time, I had to add this input type hidden, and we, and that's it. It's the same exact form from before, but it only has this 
underscore method and patch. So originally HTML uh, only allows post and get requests. We cannot say a, a patch request or a delete request, for example, or a put request. So what happens is when this underscore method comes into our server, the middleware of Rails will override the post method to a patch. I won't get into too much details what it's actually doing, but you could think of just overriding the patch. So whenever it says a underscore method name input, it's going to override it to whatever value it is. So originally it comes as a post request, but it gets overwritten in our backend, in our server side. Okay. So now if I, if I go back here and I try to update, I'll get no rel matches patch players. Notice that it's not post, it's patch because it, it's been overwritten. So let's go back to our code. We know how to fix that problem. Patch players slash ID goes to players update. So let's refresh now. Oops. That didn't work. Let's try it again. Oh, of course, the route is wrong, right? Because we need to know which page or which player we're editing. So here is going to be app player dot ID. We have that available from the controller. The controller gave that information to us. So let's go back here. update no action update routes here no action update so let's write the action okay and here if we write edu update we get a template missing but we actually don't want to don't want to have this template missing in this function we want to redirect so we want to edit the player so let's do player equals to player dot find params ID because we have that available. If player dot update, we're going to redirect to slash players. Else, we're going to do the same exact thing here. Redirect to the page that we were before. But instead of go going here, we're going to do player slash player dot ID slash edit and the same flash errors that we have here we're gonna show in here okay so let's go back now if I try to update Eduardo's information without any fields should do oh obviously so let's look at the wrong number of arguments given given zero respect to one because the update is expecting us to give us the actual information that we're going to update with. So that is params, player params, player params. So again, we're calling this private method that's going to give all the information for mass assignment. All right? Let's try it again. Let's see if, let's see if first it works. Let's update. And then Eduardo has been updated to edu. But now if I try to put something blank, Okay, first name can be blank, last name can be blank. Okay, so this is the update method. So let's try to go to edu, let's change it back to Eduardo, and update. Awesome. So it seems like everything is working. Again, let's go over this method. First, we find the player through the params ID. The params ID is coming from this guy right here. The ID is coming through there. The routes, we set the placeholder we call ID. Now update is going to return true or false, just like the save, because it does run the save. So here, I'm going to update the information of the player with all the params that were given to me. If if I'm successfully updating, I'm redirecting the user to the slash players route, which in turn will come into this method. Else, I'm saving some flash errors, right? And then redirecting to the, sh to the edit page to show those flash errors. 
So that's that's the update, guys. In this demo, we're going to create an action to delete a player. The URL is player slash whatever ID of that player. Controller will be players. Action will be destroy. The HTTP verb will be delete. Come back, everyone. So let's let's do the final CRUD operation, which is to delete a user or delete a player. So let's go back to our page and let's add a, a, another anchor tag here. So let's go to our code. Anchor tag. The route will be slash players slash player dot id and i'm gonna add i'm gonna say delete profile and i'm gonna add a couple of of custom data attributes that rails will understand so first i'm gonna add the data method equals to delete so that will tell rails that this this type of request is no longer a get request it's actually a delete request and then I'm going to say data confirm, confirm, are you sure? And all this is doing is going to have a pop up for us that's going to ask the user if they're sure that they want to delete the, the, the player. If I refresh and click on one of these, we should see this. If we cancel, the request doesn't keep going, right? If, but we, if we do actually press OK, then we see that delete players ID, no route matches that. So let's go back to our routes. Then we'll have delete players ID. We'll go to players destroy method. Okay. And now if we go back here, refresh. We actually, we don't have to refresh, but uh, we go to action destroy. We don't have an action destroy now, but we'll put that in def destroy. And all we have to do here is write some logic. So we could find the player, player equal, equals to player dot find params ID. And then we could do player dot destroy, deleting that, that player. And then we could redirect back to slash players. So let's go back here. Let's delete Chris. Uh, Ask me, are you sure? I press OK and see that Chris was deleted. Let's delete a couple more. Let's do a couple more. OK, so let's actually delete all of it. All right. Let's see what happens. Awesome. So all the players are destroyed. But notice that we have zero players instead of zero player. And we have also a lot of code that's been duplicated. And and it's not correct, it's not totally right. And it's not really the Rails way to do things. This CRUD application that we just built is to show you how Rails works. But now uh, the next demo will be about helpers and and functionality that Rails gives you to make your code a lot cleaner. And all about not repeating yourselves, all about being dry. Okay, so I'm very excited for the next demo and I'll see you then. Now that we built the whole application, we're going to refactor our code a little bit. First, we're going to use view helpers that allow that allows real programmers to keep the templates as clean as possible. Also, we're going to use partials so that we avoid some duplication. If you notice, the new form and the edit form are up they look awfully alike. So we're going to use a partial to and import that partial in those two pages so that we avoid duplication. This way, we're organizing our files in the correct manner and keeping our, our code as clean as possible. Welcome back, everyone. In this demo, we're going to talk about routes, some view helpers, and also partials. Let's start with routes. So if you notice right now, we're at locals 3000 and this is the page that we get, the welcome Rails page. However, we want that if we go to the routes, if we go to the root route, we want it to display this page. So let's change that. If you look at step two here, we can set up a root route. So let's go to our code here in Sublime. I already have everything open. This is our server. If we go to config routes, these are all of our routes, right? We could do root 
players index. Now what this does is it's telling Rails whenever someone goes to the root of our application, load the players index action, which in turn will load the slash players view page. So now if we go here and we refresh, there we go. We have localhost 3000 and that's the root page. So how can we see our routes? We could see our routes through here, but we could also see our routes by going to localhost 3000 slash rails slash info slash routes. That will give us a list of the routes. And we could also go to our console or terminal and type in rake routes. And that will give us all the routes that we have available. This, pre this prefixes here are shortcuts that we could use throughout our application to make our code a lot cleaner. Okay, for example, let me have the side by side and I go to Rails console. When you turn on the Rails console, you have this object called app, and then you could write app.root path. Okay, so our application, what is the root path? All right, I press enter, it gives us just a slash. Okay. If I write app dot players path, you can see that it gives a slash player. Okay, whatever URL the app is related to. If we do app dot players underscore URL, it will give us the whole thing. Okay, slash dub dub is amp dot com slash players. Right. Same thing we could do with app dot players underscore new underscore path and it will give us players new. So with that in mind, we could write our views so that it looks a lot cleaner and with some view helpers, okay? And one view helper that we'll talk about right now is the link to, all right? So if we go to the, let's go here in our views, app views, index.html, and we could change this so that we could have a view helper to display this. Right now we have this button, new player, just link. Let's change this to, so I'm gonna take this out, refresh, it's up here. Let's change that to the link to view helper, link to, and this is a method that will generate exactly what we have here. So the first argument is what, what's gonna display. I'm gonna call it new player. And the second argument is the path. Okay, and we already know the new player, player slash new, is players underscore new underscore path. Okay, here I could type that in, players underscore new underscore path. All right, and close this. Now I'm going to refresh. And that is, let's go to inspect element. And that is players slash new. Awesome. So let's do that for a lot of our pages. Okay, so if I go to if I go to slash player slash ID, the show page, first let's create a new player. So I'm gonna create a new player, Eduardo Bake, create a player. Awesome. If I go to the show page, I should go to his profile page. Awesome. So let's create a shortcut for this page. If you look at our route, our show, our guest show doesn't have a, a shortcut related to it, right? However, Rails allows us to create our own shortcuts, okay? So let's go back here, routes. I'm gonna say player, this one, as player. Right, so here we're saying the show action will will create a shortcut called player underscore path that will pass the ID into it. So if I refresh this page, we're gonna see that this shortcut was created. Now this shortcut will expect a ID. Okay, let me reload. And if I do app dot player underscore path, you see that we no route matches that method. However, if we call app.player underscore path and pass an ID, 
it will give us it will give us player the player slash five, right? Or player slash four, okay? Or player slash one. With that in mind, we could also change the URLs here, right? So instead of having this a tag, we could just have a link to show page and player underscore path player dot id now if we go back here refresh same thing still working now let's go back to the edit so if we go to a routes you'll notice the edit doesn't have a shortcut as well so let's create a shortcut for that okay we'll go to config routes edit and I'll call this as player underscore edit. All right, refresh here, player underscore edit path. Okay, if I go to my index.html, instead of having this, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna have a link to edit profile, show profile, let's call this profile, player underscore added and pass the player ID okay and that will be the same thing as this perfect now I go back here I forgot the path so let's go back I forgot to put the path in here okay and then now refresh there we go so it seems like it's working now I'm going to the right page, right? So we could go back here. Awesome. Now for the delete, we could do the same exact thing. Notice that the delete, the route will be the same as the show, right? But instead of a get, it's going to be a delete, right? So we could do the same thing, but in our index.html, we could do a link to delete profile player underscore path player dot id but in here we could pass a third argument in this third argument we're gonna pass the data okay we're gonna pass the data method delete and the data confirm are you sure so we're gonna say data it's a hash and it's going to have method delete and a confirm are you sure and now we're going to close this out and let's see how it looks like refresh all right i spelled delete wrong delete profile Ooh, let's refresh this are you sure Yes, I'm sure, and it works, right? So let's create another player, Christopher Burns. Let's create a new player, Lance Robertson. Create, delete profile, are you sure? And there we go. So now that we know this shortcut, we could also use, it, use them in the controllers. But first, let's change everything that we need in the views. So index looks good. Let's go to the new, okay? The new looks fine for now. Let's go to the show. Here, we have a link to the show page or to the home page. Let's change that. So link to, let's say home page. Now here, we could say root path because we do have a root path. That only works because we told the root here root path let's take this out and now let's see if that works if we go to show home page and then it works awesome now the edit same thing here let's say link to home page root path close this out I go to edit profile that link still works awesome now let's look at the controller to see what we could change there if i go to my controller let's close all these things out 
Oops. Sorry. So if I go to app controllers, players controller, here we have redirect to players. We have to re redirect to player slash new. Here we have all these URLs that we could change. So let's change them to match what we have in the views. So when we create a player, right? When we create a player, we have error messages. We have error messages here. So what we could use is this little nifty shortcut called back. So whenever something goes wrong and you want to redirect to the last page that you're in, you could just say, hey, if something goes wrong, redirect to back. Okay, very clean. So I'm going to refresh this. We don't really have to refresh because that's on the server side, but just in case that works. If we save a player correctly, we want to redirect to root. Okay. And that works because again, we have the root path set up and here we're using a symbol, right? We could also use root underscore path that will work as well, but, um, symbol should work as well. Symbol, symbol works as well. So let's create a new player here, Eduardo bake, create, and there we go. Here we have the same thing in the update. So I'll write this down here. And here, what, where do we want to redirect to? So instead of that, we want to redirect to what do we call it? Config routes. We called it the player edit player underscore edit underscore path and pass the player dot ID to it. Or actually we just want to go back. We don't even have to, cause this will be a form validation, right? So if you go to edit, I won't pass Christopher. Redirect to back. Awesome. So here we're going to redirect to root. So now we changed everything so that we're never typing the actual URL as a string. We're using the helpers that Rails gives us to write that down. Okay. Next, let's talk about some other helpers. Here in our views again, players, we have index.html. But I'll go to the home page and I want you guys to look at the title. Okay. Here we have the association in all the pages. If I go to show, we have the title still doesn't change. Okay. If I go to edit, the title still doesn't change. If I go to de uh, delete doesn't work. New player, the title doesn't change. So how can we make this more dynamic? Okay. To understand how to make this more dynamic, first we have to understand how these views are getting rendered. So if I go to view page source, you notice that we have the whole HTML document here. Okay. We have the HTML tags, the head tag, the title tags, the script tags, meta tags, uh, and then the actual body tags, the actual body tag, right? But where is this coming from? If you look at our view pages, we don't have any head. We don't have no HTML, right? We don't have anything besides what the content of the body actually is. So what's actually happening is in this layouts folder, we have this application.html.erb file. And by default, all controllers, with, if you don't specify a specific layout, all controllers will be rendered through this page. More specifically, the body will change through this yield. And all the changes, all the pages that you write here are essentially partials that get served up through this yield in the application.html.erb. Okay. Now we could yield specific things. For example, I want to yield here. Okay. A title. Now in each page I could write a specific title. Okay. So let's see what happens. by default is locals 3000. But in here, I want to write, I want to say, hey, I want this page to be something different. Content for the title, and I want to call this players. 
Okay. Now what's going to happen when this page gets, gets served up, content for will look for any yield tags that have this key of title. So for example, here, and we'll change that accordingly. Okay. So let's refresh here and look at the title players. Now in the show profile, we could change this as well, right? We don't want to be local slash 3000 slash player slash nine. We want to say Christopher's profile, for example. Now, if you go to the show page, we could do the same thing. Content for, and we want to say for the title, and we're going to call this, uh, at player the first name profile because in here we have the add player object now let's refresh and Christopher's profile let's go to someone else's profile let's go to my profile and we have Eduardo's profile so let's do the same thing with edit edit here we'll change it to content for title add it player dot first name okay now if you go to Christopher add it Christopher go back add it Eduardo awesome next let's change it to new player so here I'm gonna call something very similar the new it'll be called content for title create player oops we don't need that refresh now I could create a player this is awesome this is awesome now we have dynamic titles and we're also using link helpers right but those are not the only helpers there are actually other helpers like text helpers so if you look at our code let's go to our index.html and here i want this to be a little more dynamic and let's change how this is worded let's say listing and we'll say at let's do this listing at players dot count players or right, players dot length and we go back here actually let's go to the home page is there something wrong oops right here that that looks okay one is two players right but what about one player let's delete uh, let's delete Christopher see how players still pluralize even though we only have one okay so what we could use is methods or view helpers that reels already gives us to make this a little better so here we're going we could have pluralize helper reels here look at this we ha it's just a it's a method that receives an argument, two arguments, uh, the number and person. Or for example, in this case, we person, right? You can also say what it should be when it's when it's plural. Okay, so let's use that to our advantage. Here I'll have listing. Pluralize. At players dot length and I'm gonna have player right we always pass the singular form so let's see how it looks here now we refresh listing one player delete listing zero players create a new one again I'll create myself again create listing one player let's create a new person uh, let's say Christopher Burns, create and now we create now this is dynamically changing so uh, much better than writing some logic here
like part, like an if statement or something like that to check the length and then displaying a different text according to that. We could use helper methods that would automatically do that for us. Next, let's talk about partials. A great way to use partials is with forms. Now, if you look at our new and the edit, let me make this side by side for you guys. View uh, layout columns. Okay. Let's look at our forms. They're very similar. The flash errors are very similar. The form action is very similar. The, the only things that are changing is the, the URL and the underscore method. Okay. And what we could do is have a form helper that would be a partial that we could include here. Since they're very similar, Rails will actually figure out which page we're trying to send this form to, which page this form should be. Okay. So first let's write the form helper in here and then transfer everything to a partial. Okay. So how to create a form helper is through the form helper method. So it's called form for, and in here we're going to pass a instance variable. Okay. That's going to come from the controller. Remember this is a new page. So in the controllers, we have nothing here that we have no variable that we're passing to the new method. Now we're going to just pass a empty object player dot new. Okay. And this is very important and I'll tell you why later. Okay. But we're just saying add player equals to player dot new, just a new empty player. Okay. And we're going to say form for that player do F. Okay. And what do we need? We need, let's have a P tag in here and we're going to need a label. So F dot label. And we need it for the first name. Okay. And let's add a BR tag. And then we need an F dot text field. Okay. Text field. Last name. Well, not, not last name, first name. Okay. And then we need the same thing for the last name. I'm just copy and paste that label last name last name and then we need a f dot submit and close that now if you go to our page for the new page for the new player we're gonna have two forms very similar okay if you don't want this break tag, we could take this out to make it look the same. Very, uh, very similar to what we have before. Let's close this. Let me, let me comment this out and let's look at the inspect element now. Okay. Let's refresh inspect element. You notice that this form helper has added the authenticity token for us. He already knows that we're creating a new player because we're, what we're doing, we're passing that empty new player object, right? So we know it knows that the action should be slash players and you know, and by default it's going to be a post request. Now we could use the same logic for the edit player. Okay. So in here, I'm just going to copy and paste this into here. Okay. But remember now what we're passing, what's the add player object that we're passing here? We're playing an actual player that we found through the ID. So let's go back to our page. Let's go to the edit profile and look at that inspect element. He already knows this form helper already knows that we're trying to edit a player. Because what we're doing, we're passing a player that is not just a new object. It's all right. It's a player that actually exists in a database. So we could comment this out. Okay. Refresh. Awesome. Now, since these forms are pretty much the same, we could use partials. Okay. We could use partials to 
render this form for us so that instead of changing code in multiple places, we only need to change it in one place. So let's create a partial. So partial starts with an underscore. So underscore form dot html dot erb. Okay, so let's save that. And let's copy how the form here into here. Okay. And let's take all this commented out code here. Let's take all this commented out code here. And all we have to do is render the partial here, right? Wherever this code is. Okay. So let's do that. Let's go back to the player slash new. Okay. I'm going to take this out. Oops. We notice that we don't have anything anymore. And I'm going to say render partial. Well, let's do that. Partial players slash form. Okay. Now, when we say render the partial, we don't have to say the underscore. We could just say the folder that's in is inside of players and, and it's the form file. Now, if I refresh, the form is there. Now we could do the same thing here, right? Instead of having this, we could say render partial players slash form. Okay. Now if you go to if we go to the root of our application and go to edit, now we have this edit form. Also we still have some repeating code. We still have this flash error messages. All we could do, we could still just put it there in our partial, right? We could just move it here on top and we could just take it out here, All right? So it's still working the same, but look how much code we have in each page now, right? Everything that's related to the form, including the error messages are in this partial file. Okay, so let's see if this works. There we go. That still works. Let's go to the create. Yep, that's fine. And let's create a new player. Let's say Lance Robertson. Create player. And look at that. Cleaner code but the same functionality. Now, if I need to add something to the form, let's say I, I add another attribute, another column to my database for the player, then I could just change that, create a migration, and then just change whatever form here, or just add another label and another field, whatever field you want here. So this is how to use partials. This is how to use some of the view helpers that Rails gives us, and also how to integrate routes into into your application so i hope this was helpful and i'll see you next time at this point you have a fully functional app which is great in this unit we're going to do the exact same thing over again so this unit is technically optional but this time we're going to do it with something called capybara a testing framework that's going to make test driven development really easy for you to do in ruby on rails Yes, so in the last module, we created a whole app following errors. This time, we're going to create the same app, but following testing. So we're going to be writing our tests first, failing them, and then refactoring code and writing the code to pass the, those tests. So Capybara is a tool that interacts with our website the way that a human or a user would. So uh, things like visiting, visiting a specific URL or click, clicking a link or even submitting a form Capybara will allow us to test to see what will happen and, and write the test accordingly. So we essentially decide the user scenarios we want to test and then we program into the computer, do this, do that, just like a user would. Yes, and it will also give us error messages. So, so similar to the error message that we got through the web app, we're also going to get it from Capybara and they'll, be, and they'll be familiar because we already done that in our web app before. Cool. So in the next demo, I'll show you how to set up an application with Capybara and RSpec. Sounds good. Hello, everyone. 
in this demo we're going to build the whole application that we just built but using TDD so again if you are not interested in test driven development go ahead and and skip this video but for those who are interested I'll show you how to use the capybara gem to write tests for your features all right so first things first let's create a new project let me open my terminal and I'm going to create a new project called TDD. All right, so let's just wait until the bundler stalls everything and the generator creates our new project. All right, now, now that everything is installed, let's go to TDD. Let me open this up and we're going to need to install a couple gems here. Uh, one is the RSpec Rails gem and one is the Capybara gem, right? So let's go to the gem file and I'm going to group them. So I'm going to group the RSpec Rails gem in the Rails and development test because that's when we want to use the, the, this gem. And I'm going to group the Capybara gem in only development because we don't need to use it anywhere else. So now let's run bundle install. Awesome, and let's see what Rails G gives us. So you can see we have this RSpec install. This is what we're gonna use to install RSpec into our application and configure it, okay? Rails G RSpec install. And that will create a couple things for us. You create a spec folder, you create a spec helper and a Rails helper. So these two files are for configuration. It's gonna tell the application to run on a test environment and things like that. So here, as you can see, we have those two files, okay? And when we use Capybara, we are testing for features, okay? For example, if we go to the root page, we're testing the feature to list all the players, right? So that's what we're gonna do. In the spec folder, let's create a new folder called features. New folder feature. Oh, there we go. Features in this new folder, we're going to create a new file. This file is going to be called listing players spec.rb. Okay, let's save it and let's write some tests. Okay, so first line we need to do is require Rails helper. We're just requiring this helper file. And now what we're going to do, we're going to write our spec our spec dot describe describe list players okay and ruby block do an end and in this page we're gonna say it displays the first name and last name from the players saved okay same thing ruby block it do an end and now we're going to create a couple of players we know how to do that player one equals to player dot create name first first name eduardo last name fake and copying this this person will be burns christopher Right, and we're gonna say, hey, Capybara, visit this page and expect the following text. So Capybara is like the user. Capybara is for UI testing. So we're gonna say visit, which is a method that Capybara gives you, and visit the root page, okay? And then we're gonna say, all right, after you visit, I expect the page, this is just the, the current page that we're on, to have the text Eduardo. All right, and I expect to have the text Bake. And I expect to have text Christopher. And I expect to have text Burns. Another thing that we expect is to have a link, right? A link to be able to create a new, a new player. Expect page to have link new player. Now that we wrote the test, we could see if it fails or not. So let's go back here. I'm going to say rspec spec, the folder, features folder, 
listing players file. Let's run that and let's see what we get. Cool. Now we get list players displays the first name and last name from the player saved. Unish line constant player. We know where they're coming from. We don't have a model called player, right? That's why it's failing right here. So let's fix that. We know how to create a player. Rails G model player. And we're gonna have first name string, last name string. And I'm gonna put a flag here, no test framework. Okay, since we're creating our own uh, testing, all it's gonna do is not gonna create the testing file. Okay, see how it only creates the migration and the and and the model file. Now I'm gonna run rake db migrate. Okay, and let's try to run the test again. Okay, now we well, now we get this failure to visit visit slash no route matches slash good that means that our tests are working right so we need to say we know how to fix that so let's go to the routes config routes and we're gonna let me take all of these comments out and i'm gonna say get slash goes to players index let's Let's see what happens next. And we get routing aid, initialize custom players controller. Awesome. So let's ge generate a controller, Rails G controller, players, con players, and let's attach the flag. No test framework. Cool. Now let's go to app controllers application controller, players controller. Let's write a def index method. And, and let's run the test again. Let's see, missing template, right? So very similar to the error method that we're doing before, but now we're getting the messages in our terminal. But we know what they are. We need to go to the views, players, and create a new file, index.html.erb. And let's just fix, let's just make this you know, hard coded. Let's say uh, h1 listing players. And I know that my test is going to need to have a p tag Eduardo Bake and Christopher Burns. Burns. All right, let's see what that was. What happens here? We forgot to put the link. So now we're going to have a link to new player. And it's going to go to slash players slash new. Let's see what happens now. And there we go. Everything passes. Obviously, that's not how we want our app to look like. We want to be uh, we want to be a little better. So let's refactor our Rails code. The point of testing is to write our features first, write the minimum code to make our test pass, and then we want to write some code to make our test to make our test pass, but also our code better. We don't want to hard code these guys, right? We want we want this information to come from the database. Right, so let's go to the players controller and we're gonna say app players equals to player dot all. Here we're gonna have our HTML and we're gonna loop through the players. So I'll just copy and paste the code that we have before. Okay, so let's take this out for now. Okay, so we're just having listing players. I'm going to put the pluralize method here. The length player. 
Okay. Let's see what happens. And it still passes. I would just like to mention something real quick. Right now, when we're creating these players in the database, we're not using the development database. We're actually using the testing database because we don't want those things to conflict, right? We don't want things that we do in the test environment to, to show in our development environment, right? So if we go to development, we have two databases right now. Before, we only have one. We had the development and the SQLite. So actually what we're doing here is we're adding things to the test SQLite 3. So even though our, our development database is empty, right? Our testing is not. So we're adding things to the database. So that's how we're testing how it, how it works, right? So now I'm gonna make one last change. Here, I'm gonna write a root route is also players index and I'm going to take this one out and in the spec I'm going to say root underscore path instead of the slash that looks a lot more real railsly and let's see if everything passes and everything actually should pass so next let's talk about how to test a new feature to test a new feature, we're going to also go into the features folder. We're going to write new player underscore spec dot IB. Save that. Okay. So now we're going to also, very similar to before, require Rails helper. And we're going to write our spec dot describe page to create a new player do and in here what we're going to test is it displays the correct field to create a new player do and now in here we're going to say hey let's visit the route the root route root path but after we visit the root path i want you i want capybara to click link new user okay do we say new user or new player new player and then after we click the link new player we're going to expect the page to have the field first name and we're going to expect the page to have field last name all right now we run the test. Let's go back here. We're going to run this. And we get no routing. Okay. Routes. So we're going to write get players slash new goes to players new. And we're also going to add the get players goes to players index. I just realized that we should be able to allow the person to go to slash players manually as well. Okay. If we run this, we should get no method in our players controller, no new action. Okay. So that's what we get. Def new and, and I'm going to write add player equals to player dot new and our views create a new file new.html.erb save that and all I'm going to do is copy and paste the page that we have before okay from the other assignment new create a new player all right so all I have is the flash errors okay and I have the form so let's see how if that passes everything, new player, spec RB, and there we go. So everything passes. Awesome. Next, let's go ahead and create a player. Let's go back to our features folder. Let's create a new file. I'm going to call this create new, create player spec RB. Save that. Let's 
take this out here we're gonna always require rails helper and i'm gonna write our spec dot describe create a new player do okay now here i'm gonna write it creates a new player if the validation passes and in here i'm gonna write and 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 here it does not create a new player if validation fails so we're going to write two tests one to test what happens if the if the validation is good and what happens when the validation is bad regardless of what which one we're doing we always want cap rare to visit the slash player slash new page right so we're going to write visit before do before all the tests we're going to say visit players underscore new underscore path so let's go to rake routes real quick and let's see what happens so we have players new underscore path so we have that and we know that we need to fill in first name with let's say lens fill in last name with Robertson after we fill in we're gonna click the button create player and if we create the player correctly we expect the current path right to equal the root path all right we expect to be redirected to the root of our page next we're gonna try to create a new player and have the validation fail so all we have to do really is cl click the button create player right submit try to submit the fake form the form empty and then we expect the current path to be the root the new path right to be the same path that we're in so players slash new underscore path and we expect the page to have text first name can be blank and last name can be blank okay so let's run our tests our spec we want the create player spec rb two examples two failures no post to slash players we know what where to do that in our routes post players goes to the players controller create method all right so now i'm gonna copy and paste the create method we already know what it is okay so and then we're gonna have the private parameters all right so we know this is right let's see what happens one example one failure so create a new player does not create a new player if validation fails so we're able to create a new player if the validation passes but however right because we don't have validations we ran into here right we we, we create a new player with nothing so let's add some validations in our models let's say validates first name last name presence true and hopefully that will pass the validations and that will pass our tests and there we go so everything looks good we can also 
uh, test the whole folder, spec features, and that will run all the features tests that we have. Okay, so for example, zero failures. Now next, let's test the show page. Again, we're going to write a new file. We're going to write sh uh, show player spec.rib. Save it. Let's take this out. And we're going to require Rails helper rspec.describe player profile page do. And here, I'm going to write a before do. And all we're going to do is create a new player. Okay. Uh, player equals to player dot create. I'm going to write first name is Eduardo. Last name is Bake. So if we save it as instance variable, then it's going to be available to our test, uh, to our test below. Here, I'm going to write it displays the information about the user do and and we're gonna visit the root path and then we're gonna click on the link show profile then we expect the current path to equal slash players slash that player's ID, right? This player's ID. And then we expect to expect page to have text app player the first name and add player the last name. All right, so let's run the test. Fails. We could not. It could not find a link show profile. So that's here. We have the actions. We have another TD, and we're gonna have a link to show profile and that should be player underscore path player dot id let's change this to players new underscore path as well so in our route we need to add that so get players colon id we'll go to the player show method and we're going to add the shortcut as player. Let's see if that fixes things. Let's see there. Cannot the action show. Awesome. So here in the show, we have player equals to player dot find params ID. And now we were just missing the template, right? So I'm going to go to index new show dot HTML, HTML dot ERP, save that. And I'm just going to copy what we had before. Show dot HTML. Cool. Let's see what happens. Let's test this show. Let's only test this one file. Interesting. So, huh. I think we wrote the test wrong. So, because it's saying expected this, but we should expect something. We should expect the ID. Oh, player dot ID, not player. ID. Let's see. And there we go. Right? Everything's passive. 
Awesome. Next, we're going to do the edit. Let's create a new, oops, let's create a new fold file. Edit player underscore spec RAB. Save that. Require Rails helper. R spec dot describe. Editing player. Do. Oops. It displays a form with the values with the player values pre populated, right? That's what we have before, right? So here we're going to create an animate. So here we're going to create a player, player. Let's do the same thing that we did in the show. Okay, before we're going to create a player, player.create, and we're going to visit the root path, and then we're going to click on the link. Edit profile, and after we edit the profile, we expect the current path to equal slash players slash app player dot id slash slash edit, right, and then we expect to find field first name its value to equal app player the first name and same thing with the last name so we expect the first name field and its value to have the player first name and then to have a player last name. Okay, so let's see what happens. That is going to pass, but we want to do our spec, spec features, edit player. That fails, no link. So in the index.html, let's create a new link. So let's do the same format that we had before. And we're going to say link to edit profile. We'll say player edit underscore path player dot ID. In the routes, we're going to have slash edit goes to the edit action. And it's going to be player underscore edit. Let's run the test. No edit action. So def edit at player equals to player dot find params ID and oops, undefined method. So it should be find oops oh in the controller I wrote it wrong find now we're missing the template new file edit dot html dot erb save that and it's gonna be very similar to the show or to the new I mean but instead, we're going to have this edit at players the first name. Okay, and let's see if everything passes. Everything passed. So now we could create the partial. New here, we're going to say form.html.erb. Put this form in there and then in the edit we're gonna say 
render partial player slash form and we're gonna we're gonna say the same thing in the show in the new all right and let's run all this all the spec features and let's see if everything still passes and everything's still passing awesome next we're gonna do the update again let's create the new file let's close all of these it's getting messy so in here we're gonna create a new file and it's gonna be called update player spec rb and we require rails helper our spec dot describe updating a player do it updates the player and redirects to the root page all right however before we run this test I would like to reset the, the test database so that it's clean so that we don't have anything in there anymore okay to do that we're gonna go to our terminal and run rake db reset and only the test one okay do not be careful with this and do not say development especially not in production okay so now all of our tables have been reset it so let's try to run our spec let's see if everything's okay still everything's fine so now we could uh, write a test and not worry about having duplicate code or duplicate users so we could update the player specifically all right so let's have a create player let's create a player player equals to player.create first name is Eduardo last name is Bake let's visit the root path and we expect the page to have text let's just do my first name and then we'll do click link edit profile then we're gonna fill in first name with hello well, let's just do John okay so we expect to have John now we're gonna click button update player and we expect current path to equal the root path and we expect the page to not expect not to have text Eduardo and we expect the page to have text John right so let's run so let's run this test and let's see what we get update player spec fails no click button update player okay so there's no update player oh it's the no route patch players one right so let's go back there let's go to our routes patch player slash edit slash ID I mean goes to players update there we go so no action update let's go to the update method in the controller here 
update will be the same as before and oops okay let's run this let's see what happens and it works right so everything is working next we're going to do the delete player all right so same thing new feature delete player destroy player destroy player spec rb save that and then we're gonna require rails helper our spec dot describe correct destroy player do and we're gonna say it destroys the player correctly and redirects to the root path do in here we're gonna visit the root path but first let's create a player so let's say player equals to player dot create let's do first name let's do Eduardo last name it's gonna be bake let's click the link delete player then we expect the page not to have text Eduardo right awesome actually we also expect the current path to equal the root path okay so before we run the test I'm gonna clean the database one more time and let's run our spec spec destroy uh, features destroy spec destroy player spec b and no click link delete player so let's create that in our view in our index.html we're gonna say the same thing here and let's call it delete profile so let's go back to our spec and call it delete profile let's run that now and we're getting one failure now we get the routing error no route matches delete players one so let's go back to the players controller or the routes i mean delete players slash id goes to players destroy okay now after we go to the players destroy we want to go to the controller write the destroy method and we direct to the root page so let's run this again and everything passes awesome so this is the end of this demo i hope that you enjoy writing the errors first and how we approached it before now that we write the test first we know what the error messages are and we don't ever have to turn on the server right so we know that once we turn on the server and we check our views it will look how we expect okay so i'll see you next time and thanks for watching You've come a pretty far away at this point, and you should know a lot more about Ruby on Rails than you did at the start. But there's one aspect we've sort of neglected, how to create a new user and then to let that user continually log in to your web app. Yeah, so with login and registration, there's a lot of things that come with. We have to handle email uniqueness, password hashing, and sessions. So in this demo, I'll show you how to incorporate all those things into your application and successfully create a login reg for your Rails app. Great, so stick around for a whole new way to make your web app even more dynamic. Hello everyone.
This is the demo for login and registration. But before we start talking about login register with Bcrypt, I want to talk about styling. Right now, our website does not look that great. We don't have any styling. So there's a couple of things that we could do. If you're comfortable with CSS and you are a good front end designer, you could go ahead and add your CSS into the style sheets. And every time you generate a controller, Rails will generate a SAS file with the name of that controller, right? For example, we have players.scss. CSS is just a CSS precompiler. It allows you to do a little more things than what the raw CSS would do. However, any CSS code will work fine here. So here I have, I'm going to say all the H1s color red. All right. And if I go back to my web page and I refresh, the H1 will be red. So if you're comfortable with that, go ahead and uh, style your, your page accordingly. However, I want to show you guys how to add Bootstrap into your application. So let's go to the Bootstrap website and Bootstrap is a CSS, HTML and JavaScript framework that allows you to develop responsive sites without worrying about writing your own media queries and things like that. So it makes it very easy. Okay. You also have use a SAS or less and it's very easy once you start once you start understanding how the grid work how, how the grid works and things like that all right of course this is not a front end uh, course i will just show you guys how to how to create the bootstrap uh, a bootstrap rails application and show you some simple basics of bootstrap but the rest will be up to you to actually style your website however you want so let's go to the twitter bootstraps bootstrap sas so this is the official SAS port of Bootstrap 2 and 3 for Rails, all right? Here, we're going to install on Ruby on Rails. So I'm going to follow the steps. So Bootstrap SAS is easy to drop into Rails with the asset pipeline. So if, for those not familiar with the asset pipeline, that's, that's how Rails precompiles all your assets and into pretty much one file and then serves up to you so that the user is not making constant requests to the server for a, for an asset, for a JavaScript file, for a CSS file, and things like that. Okay. We need to add Bootstrap SAS and SAS Rails. We already have Bootstrap SAS uh, SAS Rails with with our application, so all we have to add is Bootstrap SAS, and we'll just add it right below there. It doesn't really matter where you add it. Let's run bundle install. Good. Now let's follow the next step. Let's restart. So let's stop our server and import Bootstrap styles in the app asset style sheets application .scss. So I'm going to copy and paste that into our application. Okay, there we go. So notice here that we need to change the file name to scss, not css file name rename here to scss, not just css. And there we go. Do not use the require instead of style sheets. Re then remove all the required tree and require self. All right, I'm going to remove that here. And this will now enable the asset pipeline to work out of the box. And I believe we should be good to go after that. Okay. So the server has started and let me refresh and let's see how it looks like. So look how, how the styling has changed, right? So this is the default bootstrap fonts. But now if I try to go back to my CSS file and say, all right, let's change the H1 to color red and try to refresh this. Okay, the H1 doesn't change anymore. That's because we took out the required tree and required self. So here we're saying, hey, import all the CSS files in my directory and also import all the CSS files that all the CSS that it's in my file. When we take that out, we're no longer doing that, right? So all the CSS that I write in this directory is gone. 
from now on, what I have to say, if I want to import all this CSS in my player's file, right? I just need to do this, uh, import, and then the name of the file, players, okay? Now this will import all the CSS that's in here. So now if I refresh, now the H1 is there, right? So that's how you change CSS now with Bootstrap. So you want to import all the files into here, okay? All right, so now that we know how to add uh, some bootstrap and some CSS, let's go ahead and talk about login and registration. So in our application right now, anyone could go go to this URL and log in and reg, right? So let's create a controller. Let's call it users controller. And this controller will have a couple methods to show the login and registration page and also to create users and we'll create another controller to login users. All right, so let's go ahead and add the gem that we need. So the gem that we need is bcrypt. So as you can see, we have this gem bcrypt uncommented. So all we need to do is, is uncomment that and let's run bundle install. Good. Now next, we're gonna create a, a controller, Rails G controller users. And we're gonna create a Rails G model user. And this user will have a, a name, string, email, string, password, digest fill, field, okay? Uh, password digest is is the is how the password is gonna be saved in a website. They're gonna be digested. What I mean by that, it's gonna be encrypted using bcrypt. So let's create the model. And now we have, it. okay, so if we go to controllers, app, controllers, users. Now I'm gonna create a method called index, okay? And usually this index method will have uh, all the list of the users, right? But we don't want that, okay? We want uh, only a page for users to be able to register. And also I want to make this page a page where users could log in. So one page to log in and register, right? So if you go to views, users, let's create a new file called index.html.erb and let's make let's say here h1 login and registration and let's go to our routes and let's make a root users index okay all right so let's refresh here oh let's turn let's turn back our server rails s Let's turn back our server and we have migrations. I totally forgot to migrate our model. So let's run rake db migrate. And it created table users, right? So let's go to Rails console. We go to the models file and we go to the user method, user model. We have the has secure password. This has secure password is something that comes with bcrypt and allows us to, to check the user and, and also check, allows to validate the user. Okay, so let's go back here. Let's go to user.all. There is no users. Let's create a user. Okay, so I'm gonna say u equals to user.new. All right, so this is our password digest. This column is the password digest is new. So what happens is when we connect the password and the password confirmation, bcrypt will, will see if they match and then it will hash the password for us and it will save it into this column. So if you see what I mean, notice that we don't have a password and password confirmation field. But now if I say u.name equals to John, u.email equals to John 
at doe.com and I'm going to write you dot password equals to password and you dot password confirmation equals to password and I try to save this this user then I get this user in a hashed with a hash password okay let's let me go back and and add herb so you guys can see a little better so reload or let's bundle install and let's reload herb enable uh herb enable user dot all and look at that we have John, John and Doe with the password digest. Okay. Even though in our schema, DB schema, we told that we're not going to have a password and password confirmation field. What we could do is that because we're using bcrypt, because we have has secure password in this model, we could write the password and the password confirmation field like they were there. And if they match, then then bcrypt will hash the password for us. So let's, let me show you guys another example. I'm going to say u equals to user.new again. u equal, u name equals to jane. u.email equals to doe. u.password equals to wrong password. Or just, let's have password first. Then u.password confirmation. We're going to write wrong password. All right. And then we're going to try to save this user and we get a rollback. Why do we get a rollback? Because password confirmation doesn't match password. So it also gives us error messages by default. Okay. And another error message that will give us is that the passwords must be present. So that's the power of using bcrypt. Okay. Now, if I find a user, okay, how can I check if I have the right user, right? I could do something like dot authenticate, okay? Authenticate is another method that's given us through here, and I could check if the password is right, okay? So if I type some jabber gibberish here, you dot authenticate some gibberish, right? I get false. But if I pass in the right password, then I'll get true. And then true in, in her means return the actual user, okay? So that's how we're gonna use to log in. That password is gonna come in through the form, right? We're never gonna be able to see it, okay? We're just able to see it right now for, for demonstration purposes. But as a developer, you should never mess with this, anyone's password. So you never be able to actually see it. But that's the logic that we're going to do. We're not going to do by dot first, but we're going to do something like you dot user dot find by email, right? And then we'll pass the email that they passed through the form. And then we're going to save this in a variable. And then we're going to call you dot authenticate on that. And then it gives us the right, the right user. So authenticate gives us the user returns true if the password is correct or not. Let's go back to our HTML page. Let's see if, if our login and registration page works now. And let's go back here. And everything seems to be working fine so first thing that I'm gonna do is go to my my views folder my application and I'm gonna call I'm gonna create a container class and I'm gonna wrap the yield in that container okay and what it's gonna do is gonna use the the container class in bootstrap and to 
kind of center everything for us. Okay, so let's go to bootstrap and just to make sure we could follow the documentation there. Okay. All right. So next we're going to go to, let me close all these files to make sure you guys are following. I'm going to go to the index.html derivative and I'm going to create a role. Okay. So what is a, what a role is in bootstrap is a, it's a grid, it's a grid system. So each row has 12 columns. All right. And you could choose how big a column will be by using the predefined classes in bootstrap. Okay. So, um, again, this is not, this is not supposed to be a tutorial about CSS and how bootstrap works. This is just to make our website look a little prettier because right now, uh, no one will actually want to use our website because it's really, really not that pretty. So, uh, I'm going to do div row. And in here, I'm going to create a new div with ID registration. And we'll put a class column MD6. So this, this class, all it means is it's going to be, the width is going to be six, six columns wide and medium, medium device. Okay. I believe medium device are tablets. So when you be, when you get to the tablet, it's going to become, it's, that's going to become a breaking point, meaning that the other, the other columns will stack upon each other. So we're going to create something like this here and oops, I keep doing this and I'm going to write a H1 register in here and I'll do the same exact thing. But in this case, this will be called login. Okay. Now let's go back to our page and see how it looks. Oops. This should be called login. And look at that. So now we have the left hand side to be register, the right hand side to be login. And that's because we created this role that's going to divide the left hand side and the right hand side. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and write the forms. Now let's go to the bootstrap docs and see how it looks like. So let's go to the website. Uh, if we click down here in forms, here's an example form. Okay. And I'm just going to copy and paste this down here. And what I want to do is just kind of translate this into the form helper syntax, right? So first we have the, the form helper syntax form four, and we need to pass a new user object here. Do F oops. So this user object needs to come from our controller uh, user equals to user dot new. Okay. And in here, we're going to have a form group class wrapped in a div. So div form group, and we're going to have a F dot label and it's going to be name and then a F dot text field for the name. Same thing for the email F dot label for the email F dot email field for the email. Same thing for, for the password, password, and this is the password field. And then we're going to have the same for the password confirmation, password confirmation, password confirmation. Oh, sorry. And then one last one for the F dot submit. Okay. Awesome. So I think that should 
be pretty similar to what we have here. So let's see how it looks like. Oh, we have a undefined meta users path. Okay, so we pass this object user right at user but then when it gets to the form helper it's trying to use one of those shortcuts that we we talked about okay so now i want to talk about uh, other shortcuts that we could use all right so here we have the seven restful routes okay and these are resources in rails so if we know that we're going to use seven restful routes in rails all we have to do really is write resources and then the name of the resource and in in our case is players okay and they'll be very similar to writing all these seven routes manually okay so now if we go to our routes app okay we can see that we have all these players resources right along with the shortcut okay the new player path and the added player path and the player path now we could have the same for the users resources users however for this one we only need right we only need the new the index actually and the create now if we refresh here those errors are gone cool now we have now i could take this out but i want to leave this for a second okay so let's fix some of our code because some of our code might break now so if I go to localhost slash players, we're going to get this player added path. That's an error. That's because we wrote the shortcut as player added. But what it actually is when we use resources is added player path. So if we go to our, our controller or not controller, our code, let's go to the edit. And then it's added underscore player underscore path let's refresh this now players new path that's wrong because it's supposed to be new player underscore path so let's change the this new player underscore path let's take this comment out we don't need this anymore oops refresh that that looks okay now so if I go to show that works oh the home page is that now players I don't want to delete but it should work the delete should work good players if we go to edit awesome awesome let's create a new pair Lance Robertson slash players so it's working so we fix our code and we made our routes file look a lot cleaner so I'm gonna take this out now okay cool so let's try creating a user right so if I click create user we have it goes to the right method right but we haven't created the method yet so we're gonna write dev create and and again, we're going to have the private method and it's going to be called user params and, and we're going to have params dot require the user object dot permit the name, email, password and password digest. No, not password digest, password confirmation. Okay. It has to be password confirmation, not confirm password. All right. And I'm going to go to the models, the user model, and I'm going to write validates name and email presence, presence, true. I'm going to copy and paste this regex okay and regex is going to make sure that the email format is correct all right and i'm going to write 
validates email format with valid email regex and we're gonna check for case uniqueness so that is uniqueness case sensitive false okay so we have validations now so all we have to do is say user equals to user dot new user params if user dot save then we want to redirect to where do we want to redirect the players path right we want to do, redirect to the players path else we want to redirect to back and have flash errors equals to user dot errors dot full underscore messages and there we go so if we refresh here if we try to create a user it doesn't create let's di display the error messages let me go to my form real quick let's go to here let's let's create a new row for the errors only going to create this row if there are errors okay and I'm gonna put a class of danger in here just just some quick CS styling let's refresh and try that again and it's not really making it red let's go to our bootstrap and let's see helper classes text danger okay let's try it again there we go now they're red pretty simple right so so we created this flash errors if i refresh they're gone but if i create a new user let's say let's say michael at mtroy at codingdojo.com password is a secret password now I go to the page to list the players right and then if we go to our console user.all now we have Michael Troy in our, in our database so let's create the same for for the login all right but before we do the login I forgot to do one more thing in the users controller okay we need to say if the user is safe we're gonna save in the session user ID equals to user dot ID so we're saving the ID of the user in session so we could use it for for something else later okay all right but but now let's do the login part in the login we cannot use form 4 because form 4 are for specific models okay we need to use the form tag because there won't we're going to use something called session okay so when you log someone in you're putting them in session so similarly when i created someone and i'm just taking it to the player's path i need to put that person in session so that we could use some things like security and easy accessibility to the current user logged in all right so we're going to use something very similar to form 4 but it's going to be form tag and this will be the sessions path all right sessions path do an end so as you can imagine so sessions path here we need to create that path so in our routes file we're gonna go to resources sessions only 
create right now if you refresh and we go to our routes we can see that we have this sessions path here now that we we have our routes we can actually write our tags so same similar to what we have here okay we're gonna write instead of f will be label tag and here will be text field tag email all right and here same thing label tag and password field tag password and here a submit tag sign in okay so let's see how that looks and as you can see we have that in right so let's look at the actual form slash sessions input email id email text input password id password but we don't want this to be a text. We want them. We want this to be an email, right? So if we go to this one, the type is email here, but the type is not email here. Let's change this to emailed field tag. And hopefully that's email now. And there we go. Okay. So now when we post this, when we post this, this goes to slash sessions, initialize constant, uh, constant sessions controller. So let's create that new file. Sessions underscore controller dot ab save that as class sessions controller inherits from application controller and end and we're going to have a method called create and what we need in there is logic to check what the user is who the user is right so first we could say user equals to user dot find by params password parents email sorry find by email params e email this is why we're doing email parents email all we're doing is getting the information that's coming through this form right so let's fail here fail if i pass random email email okay you can see that the information coming to us to the date to the server is this email field right and password is is not there right or it's filter obviously the reason why we're doing this is the reason why we don't need strong parameters for mass assignments that we're not really inserting anything to the database. We're just checking against the database, right? So we don't need to whitelist parameters, right? We just need to check. If if the check goes false, then uh, the user just can't log in, right? So first we find the user by email. If user, if we found the user and we authenticate its password, If that comes correct, then we save the user in session and we redirect to players underscore path. Else, we flash errors invalid combination and we redirect to back. Okay? The reason why we don't tell what the users got wrong is because we don't want for say a hacker to be able to get the email right and just uh, put a bunch of passwords after that to get the right 
to be able to log in, right? We always want to make sure to make it as difficult as possible to the hacker. So by not saying the correct information, then we do that, right? We, we avoid that, okay? One last thing here, this needs to be in an array, okay? The reason why it needs to be an array because in here, we're looping through flash errors and we assume it's an array, right? So let's go back here. If this is wrong, then I have that. If this is wrong, then I have that, all right? It's not gonna go through each letter or give us an error. So let's try to log in. Sign in. And I spell params wrong. Params. There we go. Cool. Now, let's refresh here. Let's go back to uh, mtroy according dojo. Let's go to password, sign in. All right. So let's create, uh, let's go back to our original page. And in here, where's our original page? Controllers. Models, views, players, index.html. I'm gonna create another link too. And here I'm gonna say log out. And the route that's gonna go here is slash log out. Okay. Let's refresh this now. We have this log out button. No route matches log out. Let's put that route. I'm going to say uh, get log out goes to sessions destroy. Okay. Let's go to our controller, sessions controller, our destroy method. And what it's going to say here is reset session and redirect to root. All right, so let's go back here, refresh. We res on uh, sessions control session controller routes is sessions controller. One more try, log out, and we are logged out. Right. However, if we go to players we could access that page still, right? So we don't want that. We want to somehow always make sure that the play, that you need to be logged in to access our page, okay? So uh, there's one trick that we could do, and this is the last thing that I'll show you. In your application controller, we could write a couple methods, okay? First, let's write a method called uh, current user. Okay, and all it's going to do is going to return the current user session user ID. Okay, if session user ID. All right, that's all it does. It returns the current user. Now we're going to write another method. It's going to call def require login. Okay. And this login method is going to redirect to the root route if session user ID is non existent. Okay, so unless session user ID. Okay, but we could say redirect to, oops, redirect to root path and we must put a flash errors you must log in first and end here okay so if session id is non-existent we add something to the flash errors that you must log in and we redirect the user to the root path okay now in this player's controller, 
we could call require login okay we could say before action all right require login to all routes okay and what this means is before action is a callback that gets run before rails executes all the routes and it's going to make sure to call this method require login and what is the method is in our application controller require login right and all it does is redirect to the root path if there's no one logged in if there's no session user id okay now if i try to go to slash players without being logged in it should kick me out and give me an error message right but if i'm logged in Let's go to mtroy at codingdojo.com password. Okay, now it goes to that. Even if I, I'm not, if, even if I go back and go to players, because I'm logged in, it won't kick me out. All right, so this is how to add bootstrap and how to do login and registration with bcrypt with Rails. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this demo and I'll see you next time.